Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 732. That is 732 of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and I hope you are doing well wherever this live stream may find you. I hope you are doing swimmingly. How am I? All good, all things considered, I cannot complain. All good, all things considered, I cannot complain. Hope you're all well, wherever you may hear this lovely, jubbly podcast. So, this past weekend, I've been watching um, one of my favourite series from season one called Reacher. I'm sure most of you are aware of it. It's also based on the books. Season two recently dropped three episodes and then a new one episode every Friday. I kind of hate that model. I prefer either you drop them one episode per week until the end of the season, until the season ends, or you just drop the whole season like Netflix. I hate this, like, let me give you free and then let me drip feed you after. It's fucking annoying. But regardless, Amazon got to do what they got to do to keep the numbers there and engagement and shit. But Jack Reacher is so good, man. Reacher, sorry, on Amazon. It's so fucking good. And people have described it as dad TV, but I would call it lad TV. It's so, so, so basic it's just a big hulking dude who's really just right and goes after people who do wrong to others and protects his friends that's basically it and people who can't protect themselves the you know the helpless and said whatever it may be like it starts off amazing episode one he basically um saves some woman that's been carjacked like it's so fucking basic him, him, obviously, you know, um, police work, detective work, being very attuned to like reading people and whatnot. He doesn't. He's a man of you know few words as well. But I just love the idea that it's so basic and that it's just a big hulking dude who goes around kicking ass and protecting people and stuff and standing up for people who can't stand up for themselves. It's absolutely incredible. Um, so far, season two, I've liked. Um, I was a bit nervous when it started. I thought they were going to try and do the whole like it's not about Reacher, it's about his team or it's about the women involved. You know when they try and spin things and try and be like, it's women empowerment. It's like, look, the empowerment side of things is that he's just a big hulking dude who's not a creep, right? He's not an abuser, he's not a bully. Um, you know, the, the only toxic masculinity trait of him is that he clearly doesn't, you know, he's a bit of a loner. He avoids any kind of personal connections and basically prefers to stay on his own. And it's kind of um, sad, I think, in the beginning when it first starts off um, because it kind of, you know reminded me a little bit of me and my tendencies to kind of push people away and kind of stay on my own and not be social and not have a group a good big group social a group sorry i can't even say it i'm fucking not used to it <laughs> it reminded me of myself because he doesn't really have any close connections he purposely pushes people away he lives off the grid no phone no nothing he basically lives via the charity of others to, you know um, hitchhiking rides sleeping on couches and shit on park benches and just kind of you know lives the life of a nomad and um when he gets the distress signal from one of his colleagues in the show um it's quite funny how they do it they kind of send him the distress signal via a little um via uh bank deposit drops on his um account so i think it's like 1060 or something right one of those codes that you do in the army um so then he realizes something's wrong and he calls the number that he knows off by heart and he picks up and you know and, and basically he has a catch-up with the girl that he kind of works with that he's kind of really cool with and she basically tells him all this stuff about their team because they used to be in an army team together right these special investigators who are basically i think army police investigators of some sort and um you know they went on a lot of missions whatever it may be and she basically updates him and says yeah this person's dead this person's married this person this like and he missed out on so much and he's basically like oh why didn't you call me and she basically makes a good point she's like yeah well all these things that happen people life moves on and i couldn't like reach out to you because these weren't emergencies somebody getting married is an emergency um maybe even a funeral isn't really an emergency either do you know what i mean like the person's passed away already it's like it is what it is kind of thing so um it was kind of a realization for him that even though he's important and he played an important role in everybody's life and he feels like these people are his brothers and sisters their lives go on they don't stop just to kind of wait for him to come back because he disappears so often and it kind of reminded me of myself and that you know i remember when i first got when i first jumped to instagram I, I remember that was a realization of like how little communication i had with people and how bad i'd been in terms of keeping up friendships especially from the 
first kind of big social group I had, which was the group I went with out to fucking New York with. Um, the guys from Better Never Than Late and stuff and people that used to hang around from that kind of crew. And I remember when I first jumped to Instagram, I remember that was the first realisation because I think Facebook was when we were kind of in university and then Instagram was when we all kind of got our first jobs and stuff, right? So it was kind of like our adulthood was Instagram. And I remember logging onto Instagram and seeing all my all those friends that I kind of knew from the, from before you know, had like new girlfriends, they'd moved, they'd moved to like new places, maybe in some moved to other countries, they'd hadn't, they'd gotten dogs, one of them passed away, it's like, Jesus, I was like, fuck, you know, I missed out on so much, and no matter how much I wanted to reach out and rekindle stuff, it just wasn't going to be the same again, and then I remember another time it kind of broke my heart was when I logged onto my Instagram and I saw those same people meeting up for drinks and stuff, right, and hanging out and shit, like, and I was like, fuck, and this was maybe, I don't know, five, ten years ago, and I didn't get invited, and I was like, at first it kind of hurt, but then I thought to myself, they didn't invite me because they've invited me to other things in the past, and I've always said no, or I've not turned up, so there's only so many invites you can give to somebody, and they keep turning you down, or they keep ghosting you, or they keep flaking, before you're like, you know what, let's not just, let's not count on him, so I couldn't take that person, I couldn't take it too personally, because I already had sort of like given them a hint of what I was on, what time I was on, whatever, so it kind of is what it is, but I kind of identified a lot with that, with um, Reacher in this um, series, I've got to be honest, but I think so far from the, from the three episodes in, it shows that, I don't know, I think you're, we're getting the feeling that this is one of those ones where he's going to maybe realize that he needs company. Sometimes being alone all the time isn't good. And he's going to maybe find a balance between being a lone wolf and also being with his family and friends and so, or, so, or being with his friends and maybe his love interest. Because I've got a feeling, most likely, again, spoiler alert if you're not watching anything, but I've got a feeling either Jack Reacher ends up dying or the lady that he's involved with ends up passing away, or the other lady, that's the tech person, whatever, that he's really close with. I've got a feeling some, some, one of those three will die. That'll be like a pivotal part of the whole thing. And then it obviously set up season three. But the main guy in it is an absolute unit. What's his name? I forgot the actor's name. But the actor's name that plays Reacher is perfect casting, man. Because I remember when, um, what was it? What's his name here? Let's see if I can find a name. Bear with me a second as I get the cast up on here. I remember when Tom Cruise did it they said Tom Cruise was a bad um, casting because he's so short but the main guy that plays Reacher and his name is Alan Richardson so Alan Richardson Rickson he's so good he's a perfect cast for fucking Reacher in this movie for this series because he's I think like six seven or something and he's built like a brick shit house. it's absolutely crazy how fucking jacked he is in this and you know it's all natural of course right um just some white rice <coughs> um you know boiled chicken and broccoli you know nothing else there at all zero just a just big white and fucking jacked look at him look at the size of this guy bro Look at this. Look at the absolute size of him. Absolutely massive. You can't even lie about that. Do you know what I mean? That guy is a fucking unit. And he's 6'7 or something. Like, that's a fucking unit. Look at him. Absolutely huge. But yeah, big up Reacher. If you haven't watched it already, please check it out on Amazon Prime Video and stuff. It's absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Moving on from that one, I've also wanted to say that I've been enjoying, oddly enough, Nicki Minaj's new album, Pink Friday 2. Um, I've always had a bit of a, I wouldn't say love-hate relationship with Nicki Minaj. I think I just hated that Starships era. And I think that kind of tainted her music for me. But when she went through that pop phase, where she became the biggest star in the world, because I think that pop phase definitely is the one that took her global. I just kind of had to hop off. But one thing about Nicki is that she's definitely proved in this album. And I think it's, there's some parallels here with Doja Cat. I feel like with Nicki Minaj, even if you don't like her music, Listening to her rap, listening to her put together songs, listening to the themes, the melodies, the choruses, the song construction, the sequencing on the album, even just the artwork and stuff, it's clear to see that she is levels above every other female artist in hip hop, R&B, whatever it may be. She's another level and it's not even close. And that's a really weird thing about women's rap or whatever. There's not really any of her, there's not really anybody coming up that you could say with the exception of maybe Doja Cat, and maybe even Sizz and R&B, who are really kind of on her level in terms of artistry and shit, which kind of makes you understand why she's so arrogant, why she's so confident, um, why she's so cocky, why she's so brazen, because she knows, you know, she's really that B-I-T-C-H. And this album is a proof of it because... I listened to this entire thing in, in the gym and I was fucking bopping along to it the entire time. Absolutely amazing album. 
really well put together a deluxe i think dropped recently as well with i think like eight bonus tracks or something which i haven't listened to just yet but so far for me pink friday 2 is absolutely splendid really really refreshing to hear something um this good from a female rapper because i think most of them nowadays are pretty shit so it's good to hear somebody like that can actually rap that can actually put together a good song um that isn't just talking about sucking and fucking all the time so that was really entertaining and she's she just good good to listen to I'm, I'm a sickler for voices when it comes to rap that's one of the reasons why i've never really been a big fan of big sean because his voice is just so nasally and annoying and shit even though he's an amazing rap rapper he just has got an annoying voice so this is one of the main things why i finally why i honestly do like about nikki because she's just got that perfect tone when it comes to rapping one of some of my favorite tracks to point out here would be um ftcu track three on the album um i loved i'm not gonna un unashamedly so i'm not even gonna lie i may i may have shed a tear when i listened to track six let me calm down featuring j cole i don't know what it is about that track that made me tear up and made me emotional but that was absolutely banging i absolutely loved it also loved the following track track seven um r&b featuring little wayne and somebody called tate kobanga which i'm not really too familiar with so big up nikki for putting somebody on um i love the fucking drake track um fucking needle um the drake thing has been interesting because i don't know if i've seen i don't know if this matters and stuff but i don't know if i've seen any like posts and stuff from him like congratulate Nikki on the album i know because you know artists are big on that sort of stuff right they they really they really um get sensitive about other artists not posting their music but i'm not really sure i've seen drake post anything about her album which is odd but she's he's on the album anyway um that track needle with drake is absolutely banging absolutely love it obviously everybody with louis uzi vert is a banger and definitely gonna be a hit single when it does eventually drop um so it's gonna be a hit single when there's a video for it as well um but it's definitely you know tearing up the places and i can't, I can't Im i can imagine the remixes too will be absolutely crazy um red ruby the sleeve 13 also i liked and i think this is proof that album sequencing does really matter album sequencing really does matter because album sequencing can really make i remember somebody saying the same thing about kanye yeezus i re i forgot what the track was on yeezus but i remember somebody saying that maybe it was kanye actually he i think he said he purposely switched the order of yeezus so that it would be as most it would be as abrasive and hard to kind of like and get into as possible and challenge the fucking listener and really push things forward he said i think he said if he if he would have switched it the other way around and maybe had like blood i think it's blood no leaves or something else as a first track people would have liked the album more and i think the same thing goes for this nikki track like red, red ruby the sleeves i honestly don't think i liked the single when it dropped i didn't really like it but then listening to it in sequence fucking suspended um the forward um forward from trini with um skang and skilly bang as well was really good um and i also enjoyed bam 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 kind of reminded me of this one 112 rap album single but i can't for the life of me remember which one it is i know it's got another sample on it um but there's something about Bam Bam that kind of reminded me of like a 112 song. I don't know which one it is, but I like that. Also, and another one of my songs that I also really loved was uh, um, Nicki Hendrix featuring Future, another track number 19. I think they're a very underrated duo together. I love the sound of them together. And then, of course, um, The Last Time I Saw You, 21, is a really, really great, great, great track. But honestly, super, super, super banging. Um, and as you can see here, courtesy of... Um, of genius they're saying here that how did the songs on the album perform commercially during the tracking week of end of december 22nd the total of 14 tracks from the album have debuted in the fucking hot 100 chart so clearly everyone else agrees too that the album is absolutely smacking because 14 tracks from the album are in the um, hot 100 100 which is fucking crazy but yeah definitely recommend you check it out if you haven't already Nicki minaj pink friday 2 is absolutely banging and she also confirmed pink friday 3 coming soon so it's gonna probably be the i guess the end of the series but definitely pink friday 2 absolutely tough absolutely tough next on the list i want to quickly mention and give a shout out to fucking ari lennox big up fucking ari lennox because there was a period on that on social media i don't know when it was i think it might have been maybe i don't know maybe a few years ago maybe it was during the pandemic i feel like during the pandemic for whatever reason maybe it was a contract maybe it was just a music industry maybe just life ari lennox was kind of crashing out online she feel like everywhere everywhere she was going she was going into some sort of like into some sort of like bickering and some sort of argument she was i don't know um going crazy on social media she was having arguments i remember with some south african radio sh radio show or something like that she was just going through a tough time online and it? it seemed like everybody was kind of getting on her back and um 
obviously, um, I guess at the time as well, she kind of announced that she was going to, I guess when it got, when it got really, really bad, sorry, she took a break from social media and then announced she was going to get healthy and become sober, right? Because that was obviously something that was getting, um, getting her in a lot of trouble. And I remember that I think the final straw, I think for her might have been that flight she took. She took some flight somewhere. I remember she, there was a story that she got kicked off a flight because she got too drunk and got too belligerent and shit. So obviously that was, I'd imagine, kind of embarrassing and shit. So she decided to kind of fix up her life. And the reason why I'm going to break this up is because a lot of people talk about changing. A lot of people talk about doing the work. A lot of people talk about therapy and all this sort of stuff. But usually I feel like some people use that as like a an, emo an emotional... I won't say emotional crux, but they use it as some sort of manipulation tactic so that you don't call them out on their shit anymore. Like if you say I'm doing the work, I'm going to therapy, no, you, you kind of make it seem as if like you're, you've acknowledged the problem or you haven't really. So it's a bit, it's a bit weirdly manipulative, but Ari Lennox didn't do that. She did the work silently, went away and first of all, changed her body, lost a ton of weight, looks incredible now. Um, always, always looked incredible, obviously, but still like looks banging now and has kept the weight off for the last year or so and looks, you know, in, in better shape every time you've seen her clearly got the, the sparkle back in her eyes and now she's celebrating actually which I didn't know this courtesy of her Twitter that she's one year sober one year sober so big up Ari Lennox man she says I'm one year sober from alcohol today I love you all and she did this post here on Twitter as well with the pictures of her um, in this amazing sparkly dress with her midriff out and her jeans on and I think the funny thing is about Ari Lennox I think most people when you lose weight ever since she's lost weight and she's got into fantastic shape she never not not shows her midriff she lets niggas know hey I've, I've I'm snatched. You know what I mean? She's never not reminding people online that she does a, definitely looks trim and shit. So I can't really blame her because I think I think I've said this before. When it, even when it comes, especially when it comes to guys, I think one of the greatest things you can do to yourself, apart from buying new shoes and all this sort of nonsense, one of the greatest makeovers you can give yourself is losing like ten to twenty pounds. That will really change everything about the way you stand, the way you carry yourself. It will open you up to wearing different things and whatnot. Things will just look different on you. Well, losing weight really is the biggest thing you can do in terms of glowing up, as opposed to like you know getting work done and all this sort of crazy shit like honestly it does really improve a lot of the things um that you want to wear so i mean since then has kind of reminded us all the time that she's hot girl hot girl hot girl hot girl so great to see her one year sober legitimately it seems like because you can tell via the evidence um because it's clear in it somebody like this when they say they're one year sober you can tell by looking at her right because she's fucking glowing everywhere and then when you hear someone like Bert Kreischer mentioned, he's fucking, you know, doing 32 days without alcohol and you look at his face and he still looks like a red tomato, you can clearly see that he's lying. You know what I mean? It's pretty evident to see in the body because the body doesn't lie. So big up Ari Lennox for um, one year of sobriety because I can only imagine how hard that must have been um, to do that, especially in the music industry, right? Because I got a feeling, she would never probably admit it because she's still in the music industry now because she's independent. But I have a feeling that, the reason why she was probably crashing out was because of all the stress the music industry brings, right? Trying to basically get your career up, um, trying to be relevant, trying to get a hit record, trying to tour, make music. Even now, she's getting a lot of pushback and a lot of criticism because she was on tour with Rod Wave. Um, and, you know, myself included, I think that was a really bit of a strange link up, right? Her to be supporting Rod Wave on tour. Um, but obviously that's where her kind of career is at and she's maybe trying to branch out and maybe touch a new audience. And one show, I remember watching a video clip of her, she was performing on stage and some fucking idiot threw something at her on stage. Don't, it's a kind of a trend now, you know, everyone that performs live, they get stuff thrown at them. But, you you know, you wouldn't imagine somebody like an R&B songstress, like, you know, um, Ari Lennox would like, elicit a feeling of somebody chucking a bottle at her. But she, you know, it happened. But I think she's changed a bit attitude wise because I think the next show that she did, she came on stage wearing a fucking motorcycle helmet, like kind of leaning into the meme and the joke of it. So I think she's clearly, you know, I think the sobriety and the the kind of whatever it is that she's doing in terms of internal work and health and shit has definitely made her chill out and mellow out a bit as well. But I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if she admitted that the reason why she turned to drink is because of the music industry. And that goes to show you how toxic the music industry is, that it would make you an alcoholic and it would make you get to the point where you're fucking having crash outs on fucking airplanes and stuff and getting chucked off of them. Like, it's absolutely toxic, that place. But what can you do? So big up her. And then she did post a statement here down below talking about the entire things. So I want to read to you here. A little caption basically explaining um, her journey. I'm going to read to you now. It's on the screen. Let's get it up here. Let's read this for you. What does it say? It says, it was 7 a.m. and I poured myself 
uh, no, and I poured me a full glass of Chardonnay um, in preparation for connecting flights. I just finished attending an award show the night before. You see, drinking was my ritual to combat my immense fear of flying. Wow, man. To be honest, that's what Bert says, isn't it? There's a lot of people out there that really are scared of flying to the point where they're going to get smacked to go on a flight. It's like, Jesus. But I guess this, what's the worst of the two? Taking the Xanax, sleeping pill to, to like alleviate your fears or getting really drunk? What's the what's the worst out of those two? I guess maybe taking a Xanax probably. You know, you could probably, you know, maybe I don't know. But Jesus, man, those are those are some two poisons that you're picking there to alleviate those fucking fears. I got to LAX and I drank another glass of wine uh, at an Irish pub. Nothing, nothing good ever happens at an Irish pub. Um, then I helped myself to some more, more wine on a plane. Then I landed in Detroit. I was so hammered that I didn't even check to see what time my next flight was. Thank God. Got me another humongous glass of wine. I'm talking a big bowl glass. It's actually crazy that they can sell you, you know, that kind of wine in a fucking airport anyway, no? Isn't that kind of wild that they actually allowed that, thinking about it? You, like, you're going on a plane. You're going to be however thousands of, you know, um, what do you call it, miles up in the air in a fucking tube in the fucking sky with other strangers and shit and here you are smashed you might put every, everybody's life in danger honestly man jesus christ i was so hammered i didn't even check with see your flight i'm talking a big bowl of glass um i went to a random gate and asked a woman where my next flight was and she sweetly confirmed that i missed it i remember feeling so sad and defeated thank god that next flight let the, the flight left me it was about to give no fly list shorty. I wandered off into a seemingly empty area of the airport in my cute jacket and bag. I blacked out sitting on a counter height bistro table, completely by myself and vulnerable. I woke up extremely unwell, clothes tainted with EMT surrounding me, worrying about what I might have taken. I told them I was just alcohol. Just alcohol could have killed me. I had many guardian angels watching over me that day. Thank God there was nobody filming. I pray and hope. Wow, man. She was in the airport, completely battered and bruised. That's the thing about not being super famous because she's not Summer Walker famous. She's still well known, but as R&B singers go, she's not super famous just yet. So it's probably a good thing that her career hasn't really taken off because people would have definitely been there filming. So it's a good thing it didn't happen. Um, it, those beautiful EMT employees were angels. They wheeled me into a wonderful hotel in the airport. My headache was excruciating. I woke up the next morning to catch a rescheduled flight and got drunk again. While there was many crazy nights like this, I kept telling myself... I can't, I'll keep them to myself. I decided December 18th, 2022 would be the day I got clean. Uh, you know what I realized after one year of sober flights? I never needed alcohol to get through the flight. I thought I needed alcohol to escape my reality and to cope and needed an excuse to drink and not feel the pain of everyday life and trauma. It was numbing vaca vac it was, it was an It was my numbing vacation to avoid my purpose and my truth. Yeah, that's what you feel like, isn't it? I think I've had those uh, that those kind of realizations sometimes when I've had those crazy sessions. It's like, are you just kind of avoiding the work that needs to be done? Are you avoiding kind of, you know, really doubling down on your work and really focusing on what needs to be done to kind of get yourself where you need to get to? Because that's sometimes a good thing about drinking, isn't it? It kind of makes you black out and it kind of makes all your problems go. It kind of makes all your problems go away temporarily. Obviously, they're still going to be there in the morning. But for that moment, it really does make your problems go away and it makes life a bit simple because all you want is another drink. All you want is another drink. All you want is a laugh, maybe a cigarette, but all you want is another drink. It makes life completely simple. So maybe there is that in there. I really do feel that line that she says there. I needed no excuse. I need an excuse to drink and not feel the pain of everyday life and to fake pretend that I was not. I needed, so I needed an excuse to drink and not to feel the pain of everyday life and trauma. It was my numbing vacation to avoid my purpose and my truth. It was my numbing vacation to avoid my purpose and truth. Bloody hell, what a bar. I needed it to take, so I needed it to fake pretend like I was in control. And alcohol was fun until it wasn't. It was fun until it was trauma, the drama, the hangovers, being taken advantage of. Ooh. Is she, is she, is she alluding to what I think she's alluding to? That's the thing, like, being a woman and being a drunk is very dangerous isn't it imagine the places you're going to be in drunk and being a woman is going to be really dangerous and really different to how a guy experiences being a drunk because of the guys that would want to take advantage of you in that state because there are loads of dudes that do that loads of dudes that do that like the, the, that's one thing i really do give my oh, that's one thing i'd really kind of 
not giving myself credit for. That's one thing I give credit to God or the universe and just my upbringing that I had a good group of friends that I grew up with. Um, even though my group of friends were like, you know, really kind of um laddie in that we'd go out on weekends on the pool literally we'd play football in the mornings and we'd go out to shopping centers and try and fucking chat up girls and get numbers and shit right and it was really a baptism of fire and it'll be horrible and you'd feel embarrassed and shy and you'd fucking especially if you get rejected right it was fucking awful especially in front of your friends everyone laughing and shit but it taught me a lot obviously again it kind of gave me confidence and and riz and game and whatnot to approach women but one thing was i give those guys credit for is that we were a group of guys that always never took pride in the whole like you know getting with a girl when she's drunk and shit there'd be plenty of occasions when we were out in house parties and raves where we were maybe talking to those girls or we were with a group of girls and we were hanging out together us group and their group and then maybe you know during the night um the girls got way too hammered as girls sometimes do and instead of maybe trying to ramp it up most of us would actually chip in together pay money to send the girl in a cab back home and not even try and come back to hers or anything many many a times we've done that or waiting at the bus stop with them until their bus came and shit and i'm glad that that was a thing like i never grew up with a group of guy friends who made it a win because there's some group of guys there's groups of guys and guys in general who think in their head it's a win a win's a win so if the girl's hammered if she's fucking not hammered it doesn't fucking matter like whatever they can get they fucking take it the kind of guys that you know love to fucking have their hand at the bottom of the girl's arch as they're kind of hugging them always asking where's my fucking hug at you know what i mean all those kind of touchy feely guys the ones that always turn every conversation into fucking sex and shit i'm glad i didn't hang up to all those type of dudes because the guys i hanged out with even though they were the ones that were always trying to fucking get the first wine and ask for the number and stuff when it came to actually you know sealing the deal if the person was hammered there was like it was never on like it was a it was a dub completely right off ah oh, man she's drunk like fuck you know what i mean it was like a completely right off there was no like let's follow through no 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 no. just give them money sort them out hang out with them you know fucking go find their friends so they can go home whatever it may be but there was never kind of that attitude of like hey let's try and seal this deal while just take advantage of her while she's not aware and stuff because i think that is incredibly lame and also very 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 creepy like if you're a guy that does that you're definitely should be on some list somewhere for sure um anyway continue um the night terrors the anxiety the regret and the embarrassment see i could never be i could never be a one glass cutie i'm more of a bottle and half kind of a lady jesus that's real i remember actually being on a train with my friend and some we were drinking on the way to a festival and this guy spoke to us who was um sober um he was, he was going through aa and he had one of those token things that they give you to mark how many you know whatever months you're on and stuff and he was talking to us about um, his sobriety a bit and it was funny because he mentioned something like um i think we were talking loudly on a train i think he butted in because we we're talking about drinking and he was like yeah um when i was drinking he was basically saying that how he would get through I think like five bottles a day or something, something stupid like that. And I remember I said something like, oh my God, that's crazy. How could you do that? And then he broke it down pretty well in that he was like, oh, my wife also was drinking, but not as much as I was, but I was just buying. Basically what he was saying is that he was finishing a bottle and a half. His wife would finish a half and then he'd have the other bottle. So he'd always have one. So every time he came back home, I remember, I think he said it basically quite well. He was like, oh, whenever, I think he worked in a, he had a really good job. So I think when he went to lunch, he had like a, maybe a glass of wine. Then when he went, came back home from work, which was really late, maybe nine, because he was, you know, higher up. So he stayed late. Um, he'd have a couple glasses of wine. Maybe on the way back, he might have had a steak dinner with a colleague and stuff and had a wine. So by the time he went back home, he went to black out and sleep. He'd have the whole bottle before he went to bed, reading over emails and watching TV. And that would be at least one bottle he would do by himself. And then, of course, if he's making dinner with his wife, he'd have another half of a bottle. So he would get through those bottles in a day easily and it would kind of add up to like a huge amount by the end of the month or stuff i was like whoa so yeah the, 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 that's when i realized there were people out there that actually drink for real i thought my little like you know my little kind of sessions where i have like six beers was a lot but there's guys out there that drink like that you know hot one bottle and a half every single day for like the rest of their fucking adult life and stuff it's fucking wild um but it's just you know what's really sad about alcohol it's like un unlike other drugs like class a's and stuff they're probably a little bit more brutal in that you know they cut your life short very quickly drug alcohol is like a brutal one because it's like a death by a thousand cuts it really does kind of damage you very slowly and for a very long time and by the time you realize it's too, it's too late you know that's a really sad thing about alcohol 
it really does fuck you up for a very it's like a slow drip fuck up whereas i think the class a and the harder drugs they kind of kick you over the head shoot really quickly and you you know you end up kind of dying um fairly soon especially if you're hammering it super hard but alcohol you could probably drink that for you know most of your life and then pay the price right at the end which is brutal you know like there's no kind of warning or <laughs> what's not it just kind of creeps up on you and shit anyway let's continue um see I, I could never be a one glass cutie i'm more of a bottle and a half kind of lady my toxic relationship with alcohol left me stagnant and closed person and closed eyes and him and what she's why can't i read this properly i'm more of a bottle and a half kind of lady my toxic relationship with alcohol left me stagnant and closed eyes and hindering my growth and healing hindering my ability to overcome fear and i'm no perfect person these days although i'm sure you couldn't tell um and by no means am i a perfect flyer i've had a few panic attacks on flights this year that caused some stress some stares but i'm facing this shit yo big up ucha appreciate you your channel has been a constant in my life as i've dealt with and overcame some of these same things Thanks for doing what you do. I love you, M8. I love you too, Uche. Big up, big up, big up, big up. You're a fucking G. You're a fucking G. Um, and yeah, our chats have always been very illuminating and eye-opening. And I just feel like in general, um, this channel's been odd because um, I kind of started this shit mostly as a self-therapy thing. Because like I, I've said to other people, I think I was had to, a lot of self-talk, a lot of self-chatter, right? Because I don't have any friends and probably I'm a bit of a psycho. So I thought, you know what? Let me just dump all of this stuff into a microphone and hopefully share it with people and hopefully they might like it. And that's basically where it started from. But it was kind of like selfish in that regard because I just wanted to kind of get the voices out of my head and kind of, you know, kind of quote unquote talk to people. And it's just been odd to find so many people out there that have a common that we have the same sort of like experiences you know same sort of like um things that we've kind of grown up with and around and whatnot and we're all kind of spread up spread around the world um and we all kind of share this weird commonality with, with each other and stuff so it's been great to hear some of you guys as well sharing some of your stories um in my comments and whatnot and contacting me on instagram and discord and shit so yeah big up uche love and appreciate you as well and yeah man i just i don't know i don't take any credit for it i just think in general you know there's just more of you amazing people out there than me so it's good to hear that you guys find some relatability in the things that i talk about and that we can all kind of help each other in that regard by just talking shit really and laughing and having some fun and kind of shooting this shit and pointing and laughing at fucking comedians because why the fuck not you know what i mean so big up you big up uche much love to you um let's continue here um and i'm no perfect person these days although i'm sure you could tell and by no means am i a perfect flyer i've had a few panic attacks this year that caused some stares and but i'm facing this shit i'm a real one i'm a br i'm brave even when i'm scared shitless i text my busy i text my friends and family my feelings i use the time in the air to tell them i love them that's beautiful i stay busy with educational apps and sims i know my limits and boundaries of flying i rarely fly alone smile face thanks to Kima and simone i try my best to avoid collecting flights when i'm scared i practice my breathing techniques and sometimes i get lift i get lift uh let lit off chamomile tea big up her man i pray and talk to god to keep uh, uh god up there i watch babe and cry tears of joy but most excitedly um when i'm scared of stress alcohol is no longer my innate solution so beautiful isn't it right i just be ready to land alcohol is no longer my innate solution fucking hell um that will that will be all i want to sorry um i just be oh jesus christ why can't i do this sorry the lines in this because there's loads of emojis in this making my eyes go crazy i watch babe um but most excitingly when i'm scared alcohol is no longer my innate solution i just be ready to land that be all i want every time i can visualize my destination so clearly and it calms me it's a miracle i've been running now and what down now that i finally present i'm be, i've been running and now that i'm finally present in it it's truly not that bad i ain't easy but it's all right i'm looking out the damn window often i'm letting these legendary pilots do their thing i'm letting go and i'm letting god beautiful 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 and there's the next one as well one more and we'll continue um so I'm posting this little fake deep post on my one year sobriety anniversary. I just knew it would be impossible to sober up if I was still flying. But wow, look at me. I did it. I love you, Courtney. You're so damn strong and fine as hell. God damn. Growing looks um, wonderful on you. Bravery, sexy on you. You go, girl. Thank you to my fans. I love you. When I, when y'all share with me your sober dreams and, f and fates, it makes me so emotional. I'm so proud of you all and I love you all so much. We can do this. Thank you to my family, my friends for keeping me accountable 
possible. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being patient with me. Thank you for everybody of the on the I Am Sober app. Baby, we're doing it. Oh, that's awesome. There's an app that you can connect with people as well. Community. That's really awesome. Y'all knew how many times I wanted to give in. Y'all was so sweet and motivating. We powered through. Um, let's keep going. Follow your heart. Cheers to another year of being present and growing deeper than ever before. One day um, at a motherfucking time, baby. Thank you to my fans. I love when y'all share with me your sober dreams. Okay, cool. We read it already. So big up Ari Lennox. You're an absolutely G. Um, amazing to see the growth in her. Amazing to see her do what she's doing. Walk the walk, talk to talk. And I only wanted to mention this because again, I think a lot of people talk about stuff like this and you know flex like they are doing the work. But when you actually see someone doing the work, the results are evident. Her whole demeanor has changed. Her attitude has changed. You never really hear her in the news crashing out, going crazy as she did before in the past because she's clearly done a lot of the internal work, the hardest thing to do. Do you know what I mean? So big up her for doing it. Um, Appreciate her for sharing her journey and being so open about it because again, it's no one's business. She could just keep this to herself, but she did it anyway and hopefully encourages others to sort of like maybe, you know, maybe do some of that internal work, see if they've got issues and kind of solve it because she's done, she's definitely a, a, a kind of an example of what solving it looks like and how good it can look on you because she's never looked so good she's never sounded so good and obviously clearly that's coming through the music because i think she's producing some of the best music she's ever put out to be honest and then that also goes against the whole adage of oh you have to be fucked up to be a good musician i don't believe that because i think she's sounding better than she's ever had to be honest in my personal opinion but again what do i know big up Ari Lennox, you're a fucking g you're a fucking g moving on moving on unfortunately we have some absolutely distressing news here to talk about here and another black man has fallen to the justice system fucking hell man jonathan majors found guilty of harassment and assault really really sad to hear this not surprising to be honest but sad especially if you've been following the court case and the case in general um the evidence that was made available made it seem like it was very improbable very unlikely that majors did what the girl accused him of doing there's so much evidence in his favor there was evidence of him running there's video footage of him running away from the girl literally physically running away from her as she's attacking her there's um the driver of the car that they were in who was willing to testify that as he was driving the car it was a woman his ex-girlfriend that was hitting him the whole entire time and raising her voice and being very abusive and physical and shit um there was obviously the police footage as well where they go into his house and she's in the walk-in closet by herself half naked lying on the floor for some reason there's a video footage of her in the nightclub the same night that she allegedly had a broken hand or something from the abuse that John Major did to her and she's dancing around having a good time getting handsy with the DJ behind the booth like toast you know toasting herself and drinking she's all the stuff that she accused Jennifer Majors of there's evidence to prove there's evidence available out there that kind of illustrates that most likely he didn't hit her the way she said she did. She he she did. He might have been a past. That's the thing. He might have been a past, but what she's accusing him of hasn't happened. But it's also kind of tragic because he was about to be the next big star. He was about to be the next big black movie st- Hollywood actor guy because of his range, um, because of the roles that he's played, because of his performances. And it all came crashing down in epic fashion. And if anything, this is another proof and evidence that I've always said, as I say this with the Tory Lanez thing, and I think in general, I just have this extreme ownership point of view, and I always will. And I think as a man, is as a kind of quote-unquote leader, as quote, you know, you always have to have that sense of leadership, that sense of kind of... um ownership and situations where i'm gonna say i still put the majority of the responsibility of this on jonathan majors i feel like guys have this idea of kind of um putting on the pedestal girls that are crazy because allegedly the idea behind that is that girls that are crazy are amazing in bed and i think one of the cons of getting with girls who are crazy is that they might end up in this situation yes you might end up having some of the best sex you've ever had Yes, it might be super passionate. Yes, it might be your soulmate. But the consequences, the the cons for it are extreme because when they fly off the handle, they can get you in big trouble. They can make you lose your entire career. They can make you maybe spend time in jail or in prison. That's the flip side of hooking up with a girl that's crazy. That's the thing. It might be intense. The love might be amazing. In connection might be banging. You might be banging in fucking car parks and cinemas and shit, doing whatever you need to be doing, hanging off fucking swings, right? It might be awesome, but the cons of it are stuff like this, where you end up in a situation where 
you know, this girl's legitimately crazy and you have now lost your career. Big up, Illusionary Commissioner. Appreciate you. That's a creative character knows if I ever saw one. <laughs> Big up, Illusionary Commission. Yeah, exactly. Big up you. Thank you for the super chat, brother. I honestly do think he fucked it himself by hooking up with her in the first place. He should have ran away from her sooner rather than before. But it's just crazy article. Jennifer Majors guilty of harassment and assault, um, courtesy of Variety. Jennifer Majors was convicted of assaulting his ex-girlfriend, Grace Jabari. Even her name is fucking snitchy, you know? Grace Jabari. That sounds like somebody that would fucking snitch on you. That's the time someone that will even tell you, tell, snitch on you to your fucking mum. That's the worst type. Um, the Manhattan jury found the Marvel actor guilty on Monday of two misdemeanor counts of harassment and assault, but acquitted him on two other counts. The six-person jury found Majors not guilty of one count of intentional assault and third degree and one count of aggravated assault in second degree. So he got found, of, he got found guilty of the lesser assault charges and not the other ones. Why? What, because they couldn't prove that it wasn't him that did it? Jesus Christ. Honestly, being black in the justice system is awful, bro. Because there's a... There's body cam footage of the police going to Majors' um, penthouse apartment, right? He's got this amazing penthouse apartment somewhere in New York. He might have moved out from now. And um, he calls the police because I guess he couldn't get into his walk-in wardrobe or something or something like that, right? So he, he calls a, he calls, no, he calls a, he calls a handyman to open the door for him. They open the door to his apartment or something. I think it was locked. And then he finds his ex-girlfriend in the walk-in closet, naked from the bottom down, uh, you know, on her back, like can't move. And then he calls the police. The police come to the, to the building, to his apartment, sorry, his penthouse apartment in New York. And they say something really snarky, like, oh, how could he, have, how could he afford this? Because I guess the police officers, they didn't recognize Jonathan Majors. So they're wondering how this black man could afford this amazing apartment in this thing. So immediately as they walked in there, they immediately thought he was guilty. Even though he's the one that called the fucking police, even though there's evidence and there's witnesses in the, you know, as the fucking concierge person downstairs, security, the fucking handyman, are all evidence that he's the one that asked them to go open the door because it was fucking locked and he couldn't get in to his fucking own apartment. They're the ones that are like, oh yeah, how did he afford this apartment? Do you understand how fucking horrible that is? Like, honestly, man, like, he was already like prejudged before he did anything because he's the black man and she's the fucking innocent white lady. Horrible. But it's, again, I don't know. Let's continue. Um, Majors wearing a dark grey suit seated in the courtroom with his attorney and current girlfriend Megan Good did not react when the verdict was read. Judge Michael Gaffey set the sentencing date for February the 6th. Majors faces up to a year in jail, but he could also be sentenced to probation. Yeah, most likely he'll get probation. If he got the two or lesser charges, I don't see him getting prison time. Hopefully he doesn't because he's definitely not guilty of the crimes he's been accused of. The only problem that he has, the only problem that he has, the only problem he has it as is this. I remember when the story dropped, loads of people within the performing arts world of New of New York or wherever he's from. No, I think he went to Yale. Maybe it's New York. I don't know. But wherever he grew up and wherever he came up in, wherever scene it is, the performing arts community on Twitter, loads of people started like saying things that like he was abusive from from the jump. A lot of people were like not happy that he was even becoming famous. They were like, oh, you don't know what he's like behind the scenes. And they were all kind of saying things without saying it. They didn't really detail what happened, but a lot of them were saying that, oh, this guy isn't a good guy. So that's the only thing that's a bit like, you know, like maybe he got found guilty of something he didn't do, but maybe in the past he might have abused her. That's possible. But for what's on trial, for what I've seen so far, he didn't do what he was accused of, honestly. There's video footage of him running down the street away from this woman. And I think if I'm not mistaken, I read somewhere that they found him guilty because he pushed a woman back in the car. The woman was trying to grab him to keep him back in the car, to hit him or whatever, scream and shout. And he kind of pushed her back in the car and ran away. And they are basically using that push in the car as a form of assault. It's like, can't you defend yourself? He didn't strike her. He didn't with an open palm, with a closed fist, nothing. He pushed her back into the car because they were arguing and shit, ran down the street. And I think the running down the street thing is funny because there's a video of him actually running down the street away from this woman. And if I'm not mistaken, there's also footage from somebody, like some random women on the street recognized him and asked him for a selfie. And he took it. This guy's such a pro. He ran down the street away from his fucking abusive girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, and then he bumped into some fans. They asked him for a selfie and he took it. So there's evidence of him, you know, there's even pictures of it that happened and shit. So, and he still got found guilty. He just goes to show, man, black men have to be really careful out, out here because your life is really in the balance at all times. You have to really acquiesce. And he's a very softly spoken black dude, highly educated, cultured and shit, right? And still, what did they see? Just a big black dude. 
and a very dainty white woman uh, and an apartment they, they thought he didn't he didn't really he couldn't afford because he looks like fucking Oliver Twist with his little hat and shit fucking hell uh, let's continue Major was arrested in March in New York City after he assaulted Jabari in the backseat of his private vehicle Jabari a 30 year old choreographer who met J Majors on the set of Marvel's Ant-Man and Wasp Quanti Quanto Quantomania testified that she grabbed Majors' phone after seeing a text message from another woman I wonder if that other woman was Megan Good was that how their relationship started so he was banging Megan Good at the same time or on the side she saw a text from her or him texting her and that's what started the whole beef. Wild, isn't it? Um, test, and again, Megan Good is like a, a, a very much a big upgrade to this lady because she looks like a fucking old woman, to be fair. Jabari described that as Majors' attempt um, to forcibly retrieve the phone from her. She felt a hard blow across her head that resulted in bruising, swelling and sustained pain. I don't know. There's a part of me that thinks if somebody as big as Maj Jon Jonathan Majors hits a woman as small as she, she would be out. She wouldn't have just a bruise. You know what I mean, like if somebody as big as that punched her in the back of the head, she'd probably be unconscious, right? You'd imagine. Um, shortly after the guilty verdict, Marvel Studios severed ties. Yeah, and again, this is the the other bit that's really sad about it. Curse of deadline. Jennifer Majors fired, fired by Disney Marvel Studios straight after the guilty charge. And again, guilty on two of the lesser charges, but they fired him straight away. So no more Kang the Conqueror. Fucking hell, man. That's the. Can you imagine how big that bag is? Can you imagine how big that fucking bag is? That bag. That this might be the biggest bag fumble of all time. And it's not it's sad to say because it's not really a bag fumble because it's it's a domestic dispute and it's something that he's clearly, I think, the victim of. Can be illusionary commission, I appreciate you. What his defense was, but I was a king. <laughs> <laughs> that's good but i was a kang <laughs> we were kangs big up legendary commissioner <laughs> you're fucking hilarious honestly man like can you like can you imagine the bags the appearances the toys that can, um quite like the residuals can you imagine the bag that he's missed out from this fuck that's generational wealth gone and now what? He's going to be what? Uh, he's going to be forced to do movies on fucking Zeus, Tubi and fucking BET. Damn. Um, the title here, Jonathan Majors fired by Disney and Marvel Studios after assault guilty verdicts. Actor had played Kang the Conqueror. It said Jonathan Majors is out of Marvel Studios kingdom. The news comes today in the wake of the Emmy-nominated actor being found guilty of reckless assault and harassment in domestic violence trial by six-person NYC jury. A studio rep confirmed the news about the decision not to move forward with Majors in the MCU. So there's going to be a new Kang coming up soon. Majors played the, the mega villain, He Who Remembers, aka Kang the Conqueror, in Marvel Cinematic Universe's Phase 4 through 6. He debuted as a character during Season 1 of Loki in 2021, then continued on in Season 2, this year as well as February, movie Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, which made more than 40... S Look how much this fucking movie made, I haven't even watched it. Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania made $476 million worldwide. Majors had also had a back-to-back -back hit with Amazon MGM's Creed 3 in March, which grows to, oh my God. So he's probably lost Ant-Man. He's probably lost, sorry, MCU. And he's probably lost the Creed franchise too, right? I'm assuming. I think even um, Jordan, J Michael B. Jordan might have lost that too. I, I saw a report, Michael B. Jordan crashed his Ferrari somewhere. So that was also gone. Having stuck with the actor over the eight months since his arrest, um, his longtime agent, Ellen Rispulio, testified briefly in Major's defense last week as the last witness in the nearly two week trial. He who remembers was plotted to be a big baddie during the MCU's phase five and six. Why are they using the term big baddie in a deadline? God almighty, journalism is dead in it. Um, he who remains was plotted to be a big baddie during the MCU's phase five and six with the character getting his own movie Avengers the Kang Destiny scheduled for May the 1st 2026 that movie recently saw its director Shan Chi's Destin Daniel Creighton exit due to his busy dance card on other Marvel projects in TBD is TBD in regards to whether Marvel keeps Kang the character intact while recasting is part of another actor? Michael Walden recently was tapped to write Avengers. Blah, blah, blah. So probably recast him, but yeah, his fucking career is done. It's over, isn't it? His career is done all because of a domestic dispute and most likely it's done because he's the one that called the police. 
because he called the police, he kind of fucked himself, even though he was doing the right thing. They came there and it kind of immediately made him into a suspect. Um, for some reason, the evidence that we've all seen online didn't count. I don't know why. Again, maybe it's the, maybe I, I'm not really aware of how the court system works. Maybe you have to prove you didn't do it as opposed to how they have to prove that you did do it. And maybe they could not prove that he did not do it. You know, maybe that's the thing. I don't really sure why, because the evidence I've seen so far shows me a man who was struggling to, uh, you know, how to deal with a woman that's physically abusive and stuff. Because it is a bit of a mind fuck, right? What do you do as a guy if you're in a relationship with a woman and she's physically abusive? Like, it's hard to kind of deal with that situation in a in a in the right way. Um, it's you know when you defend yourself you, th there's a possibility that you might hit her or you might strike her and you might push her you're a stronger guy your force your powers way you know way more than hers you might make her fall down like there's all this stuff that's happening that's hard um you know you can run away she can follow you it's a bit it's a bit mad man it's a bit mad but yeah jonathan majors man what can you do what can you do what can you do moving on We've also got this post courtesy of Nat Clubs Berlin that I wanted to talk about regarding Berlin as a place because I thought this was a really eye-opening um, conversation to be had here just in general about living in a place like Berlin and living in cities in general where it's all about individual expression, it's all about freedom, it's, it's all about freedom of choice, freedom of, you know, what sexuality, religion, whatever it may be, right, interest, you're kind of left to your own devices in that regard, right? It kind of empowers you to be the best version of yourself. Like, I think London is a good example of it. Obviously, New York is one, obviously places like Berlin and a few others around the world. But this girl had a really good um, opinion and a really good perspective on the difficulties of what she's learned growing up in Berlin or living in Berlin for the year. And I thought it was very eye-opening. So I'm going to play it. I think it was this girl here wearing this Banaclava thing. And let me get up on here. I got it on my little streamable. She had a really good point in terms of how it is to grow up or live in a city like Berlin. So let me play what she had to say here. What did you learn in Berlin? So I've been living in Berlin for like a year and a half. I think the number Actually, let me, let, me, let me replay that one more time. What did you learn in Berlin? So, I've been living in Berlin for like a year and a half. I think the number one thing that I learned here is to not give a fuck about anyone or anything and what they think. Um, I guess it's like a learning experience that takes a lot of time. And in Berlin, it's like express way to not giving a fuck. You quickly realize, you know, it's kind of a lonely place, it's kind of a dark place, it's kind of a cold place, also emotionally cold. People are not the most welcoming or the most anything. It's like a lot of places, but I guess here you really have to make your own happiness and you have to be able to do that quite quickly or else you can get depressed and you can fall into that pit, which is not useful. So yeah, I think it's a lot, it's a big self-learning experience and you can make it as deep as you want it to be. I love that perspective from her. I love that perspective from her. That although Berlin is super empowering and free and you can be who you want. And I think that's something I realized too when I went out there. It was really amazing to go to a place where you could basically wear what the fuck you wanted and no one would really bat an eyelid. And I think for me, coming from a place like London where people are very judgmental, in the UK in general, everybody kind of quietly judges you on the things that you're into, the things that you wear, the places that you go to. Um, you know, they always kind of have something to say about it. It's also quite refreshing to go to a place like Berlin, especially a place like nightlife where mostly people just wear whatever they want to wear, right? Freedom of expression is definitely seen on the dance floors of Berlin. It was a real eye-opener to see that because it was not really about what you wore. It was about who you were as a person. It was about the way you were dancing, the way you were communicating, the way you were just kind of embracing and kind of adapting and immersing yourself to the environment and shit. That said way more about the you than your actual clothes. No one gave a fuck about what brand item you're wearing. Yes, style is important, but the labels, all this flashy stuff were important and that was also super sick to see but i like that she said that on the flip side that hyper individuality that freedom is also very almost intimidating and almost a bit lonely right it can be a little bit lonely because everybody's doing their own thing everybody's living in their truth everybody's living in their purpose everybody's kind of going in their own direction steadfastly and if you're not you know doing what you're meant to be doing you could just be left on your own 
and everybody's kind of on doing their own projects doing their own thing with their own friends whatever it may be living their life finding themselves and you could quickly quickly realize that you're kind of alone and don't really have a big social group i can see that happening because again like i've said like i think i've met way more quote-unquote dance floor friends the times i've been to berlin than any other place i've been to in the world raving but i could also imagine it being day to day again this is me being a tourist it's a completely different I'd, I'd imagine being a berliner tourist and also living there can be a completely two completely different experiences but i do think there's something to be gleaned from it in that even though i've met a lot of like dance floor friends i could also imagine it day to day being a quite a lonely place because everybody's doing their own thing everybody's an individual in the truest sense of the term not in like the hipster sense of the term where they're all individuals but they wear the same thing no they're all individuals like it feels like in berlin people go super out of their way to be different like people don't want to look like somebody else and i think i kind of saw a little bit of that um like when i went to berlin recently and i had a bit of a bad time where i kind of felt like a you know i was getting kind of vibed out by some of the cool black guys there and girls and shit because it felt like i kind of got that kind of you know i kind of got the feeling like a lot of them wanted to be the only cool alternative quote-unquote black within their social group right they didn't want to have another british guy come over who was loud and whatnot and doing his thing trying to kind of take up their space but then when i kind of stepped back and i went and i kind of thought about it a bit i was like that makes sense though they've carved out their own little space they've carved out their identity they've finally figured out what their role is in their social group and they're being protective of it that makes complete sense it's completely okay so i kind of understood that that's also part and parcel of living there it's also that kind of i wouldn't say territory it's kind of territorial in that respect of like yeah i'm I, I know what i'm about my friends know what i'm about and i kind of keep that kind of close and i think that kind of works for them all the things going forward but i really did like the way she expressed her opinion on that and i think it kind of made a lot more sense in terms of me understanding the berliner sense of my sense you know mindset and how they kind of communicate and navigate around things and stuff it really does make a lot of sense there and um, what you guys saying in chat um well they're pretty close to scandinavian countries where people will party hard but hard to get to know yeah exactly z good example great example big evolutionary commission appreciate it bro europe is trash compactor of misery nah get out of here get out of here europe isn't trash europe is fucking amazing man Europe is fucking amazing. Get out of here. Europe is great. Europe is great. A big evolutionary commission. But yeah, Z, you're right as well. You're right about that. Um, everyone parties hard and you feel like everyone's your best friend. But then I think after the fact, it's not the same. But I also have to say, I'm, I am I, I used to have a... I don't do it anymore. But I used to have a tendency to be like the serial friend adder and follow on instagram type of guy right i'd meet somebody in the rave i'd have an amazing you know super charged and high and drunk connection with them in the fucking bathroom store somewhere over a couple of lines and then i'll be adding them on social media thinking that we're best friends and then be texting them the next day and then they you know they kind of go sing you and they don't want to know you anymore and i used to always take that shit personally but i think that's just a common thing that happens in dance like in dance you know nightlife and shit and i think it's not that you know it's not that deep really it's mostly just like you know they're over it the next day the party was a party now it's their real life and they kind of don't want to know you it's completely fine but i do feel like in berlin i've had way more success with that i've had way more success with meeting people in bathroom stores and then meeting them again in fucking restaurants the next time i go or in a bar over a drink it's never, you know what I mean? I, I feel like it's actually worked pretty well in that regard. So there's clearly an ability, I think there's an ability in Berlin to do that. You can meet people in nightlife. It can start off being hedonistic. It can start off being very, um, you know, very kind of uh, leisurely, but then it can develop into a real friendship and a real connection, especially if you share a lot of commonalities and stuff, it can happen. So I love that to be a thing going on in there. But some of the comments on the social media are very, very harsh on this girl. I'm not going to lie. So I'm going to play, I'm going to play the video actually one more time and then kind of go over the comments but the comments on the social media on the actual instagram post of her saying what she said were not the most favorable and i wonder if that's a good reflection on how people feel in berlin about what she said or if that's just people trying to be contrarians and or just the nature of instagram in general because instagram comments are known to be super super harsh right it's really funny that isn't it i find that twitter is very snarky and cynical instagram is super harsh um when it comes to comments for some reason facebook is kind of chill and i guess tiktok is a bit of a flip of a coin but for some reason instagram comments are really mean <laughs> i don't know why people on instagram are way more meaner but it just is what it is what did you learn in berlin 
so I've been living in Berlin for like a year and a half. I think the number one thing that I learned here is to not give a fuck about anyone or anything and what they think. Um, I guess it's like a learning experience that takes a lot of time. And in Berlin, it's like express way to not giving a fuck. You quickly realize, you know, it's kind of a lonely place, it's kind of a dark place. It's kind of a cold place, also emotionally cold. People are not the most welcoming or the most anything. It's like a lot of places, but I guess here you really have to make your own happiness and you have to be able to do that quite quickly or else you can get depressed and you can fall into that pit, which is not useful. So yeah, I think it's a lot, it's a big self-learning experience and you can make it as deep as you want it to be. You know what she said about the point? I just thought about it now. The point that she made about you have to find what you want or you have to find things to do like very quickly. You have to find your purpose, right? Um, I guess find some hobbies is really true because I feel like places like Mediterranean countries like Spain I've been to and obviously Berlin I've been to as well. I feel like those type of places, what they do really well is that they have really good work-life balance. And I feel like they don't like work to live, right? They have a really good balance between working and obviously they're leisurely, you know, fucking out of work fucking activities and shit. So I think because of that, they do really go to town with the things that they're into, whether it's, you know, going to art exhibitions, taking pictures, walking their dogs, running, whatever it is, they're really deep into it because they have a real good work-life balance. Whereas I feel like maybe, I don't know where she's from originally, she might be American, she might be UK, I don't really know. But I guess in the UK for sure, we don't have that. So a lot of your free time is spent up going to drinking and working basically with your colleagues There's not really much time for hobbies because you're working until 6 or 7 p.m you might go out for drinks after work with your colleagues to drown your sorrows and then that's it really there's no real time to do things to have hobbies to have interests and shit it doesn't really happen most of your interests are kind of revolved around drinking and going to bars or going to restaurants and drinking and shit so that might be the reason but let's actually read the comments here via instagram because i think the comments on instagram were kind of fucking weird it seems like people on the Instagram, on the actual account, didn't really agree with what she said. So on the Instagram page, this is what they said, right? Um, the, the, obviously, you got her Instagram here. Her name is, what's it? Sophis. So that, that's her name there, right? Sophis Escrit. If you want to basically check her out there, it's on the Instagram account called Nat Clubs Berlin, which I've been following for a while. When I first started following them, I think during the pandemic, I think, or maybe just before the pandemic, they were they were known for taking these amazing 35 millimeter um, pictures, right? These amazing point and shoot pictures, film pictures of people leaving um, Berlin clubs, primarily like Berlin and um, Berkheim and shit. And they were really cool because there was these cool, you know, portraits of people in some of their most blissful moments as they're leaving a fucking nightclub. I fucking loved it. But anyway, let's see what the comment says. The comment as follows follows. Um, there's one here in German. Let's see if I can translate it and it kind of makes sense. I see. She says here, this person in German, which is translated, says, almost two years in Berlin and not learned a word of German. This is considered rude in the US. What do Germans who live in the US for more than two years say? People like you have to turn your our city into a day and night party zone with no consideration for people and without interest of the people who live here. We are starting to get on our nerves. Wow. So there seems to be a bit of a distrust and a bit of a backlash when it comes to expats and shit um it's weird because this sort of statement these sort of criticisms are odd because it's kind of in part their fault because they allow you to speak english because whenever i've gone to paris it's always incredibly eye-opening and refreshing even when you go to places like madrid um which probably isn't as i think as um englified as maybe barcelona that you go to those kind of places and they only speak spanish and they only speak french you can't really get away with speaking English for the most part because most people don't unless you're in a city centre. So you have to go there with a little bit of, you know, pocketbook fucking, you know, language, you know, and be able to order a beer, be able to ask for directions, bloody, what time is it, where am I, all this sort of shit. It's really important. But their countries and their people are the ones that kind of impose that because they don't indulge English speakers too much. I feel like Germany, for some reason, I don't know why it is, to be especially um, why particularly Berlin, but they are very... I think open to that like you could go to a fucking a kebab shop you in in the depths of the ghetto in berlin and you'll find a guy there that speaks english and they'll be happy to serve you because i feel like if you go to a place like paris you go to a place like madrid the bartender is going to be talking to you in in, in in fucking french and spanish respectively 
You know what I mean? They're not gonna even if they know English, they're gonna go out of their way not to speak it to make you fucking speak French because you're in their fucking country. So I think the responsibility lies a little bit in the country themselves. They need to kind of impose that, you know. Um, but also I think me personally, if I did move to another country, I would go out of my way to learn the language. Personally, if it was me, I would go and learn the language. You know, I wouldn't go there just to go and you know. It doesn't make any sense, really, truly. I'd try to learn that. Even if I lived in fucking Amsterdam, I would do it. I wouldn't just go there and just try and, like, say what I want to say. Just go there and kind of do what I've been doing in the UK. I think part of, like, um, deciding to live in another country is sort of like shedding your old identity and really immersing yourself in the new country that you're in and making that your life, basically, and kind of embracing all parts of it. And I think one of the biggest parts of it is language and really and truly the language barrier and actually lang learning the language of the country you're in can, I reckon, open up the, la the country or in the place that you're in, the city you're in, in a different way. It really does open up people because, um, you know, language is a way for us to understand each other, all parts of ourselves. Um, and once you get past that language barrier, it can really drastically change your experience. And I've learned that myself. I remember when I used to do um, all my races and shit, one time when I went to Barcelona um, a few years ago to do like a half marathon there, that was when I was really hyper um, learning or hyper focused and trying to learn sp Spanish. And I had a decent level of Spanish, not that great. But when I went out to Barcelona, I purposely went, um, to one of these um, meetup groups where you did like 15 minutes speaking English, 15 minutes speaking Spanish, right? And you kind of rotated. And I swear to God, I was there for a weekend. I think the race was like on a Sunday and I left on a Monday. And my Spanish improved like tenfold just from immersing myself in that, like doing that little 15 minutes on, 15 minutes off on Spanish thing. Also just walking around the city, ordering drinks, going to coffee shops, having breakfast, all this sort of stuff, communicating with people, it drastically kind of improved it. It made me realize, oh shit, when you live somewhere and you actually try to communicate with people and speak to people in real life, apart from just like, you know, sitting on Duolingo and reading books and shit, it can really put the language into context um, and actually make you learn it quicker because you're actually, you know, using it day to day. Anyway, another person says, what did you learn in Berlin after two years living there? Obviously not one word of German. Congratulations. Another one, learn German language and shut up. 171 likes. Wow. Another one, I simply cannot grasp the notion of a cold Berlin. This city, this city breathes tolerance and grants freedom with no other. It's here. It's in this embrace that I've made my home. Berlin allows me to live by my own rules, to think and create freely. For 23 years, I've been a part of this vibrant street, surrounded by incredible friends who are dear to my heart and whose love I feel every day. Yo, this guy is really sucking himself off, isn't it? You need to chill, bro. You need to relax. My neighbours are more than just faces. They are part of a community where I feel safe and cherished. In Berlin, I find my breath, my inspiration. It is here that I'm truly myself. Come on, mate, do over. Give your head a fucking wobble. It's lovely what he's saying, but it sounds fucking nauseating. But I also think he's really not understanding what she's saying. I think this is, makes com complete sense. If you do live in a city that is, you know, um, hyper individual, no, pushes the pushes people to be individuals, it's within reason to expect some people might feel lonely because you're being high, you're being individualistic in some respects, right? When you're kind of striving to kind of discover yourself and to express yourself, you know, true in, you know, whatever way it is, there's going to be the flip side of it where some people are going to feel a little bit isolated, a little bit lonely. It makes complete sense to me. I don't really think it's a slight, just an observation really, to be honest. Another one says, people are not cold, they are honest. They will not pretend to be your friend, but if you earn their friendship, they are the best friends you will have. And I think this is the best comment I've seen. And again, that's probably why it's got the most likes. This is probably more true than anything else people have said, because I think that's one of the bad things about London. We don't have that. We have a lot of like fake warmth, right? Hiya, how are you? How's your day? How, for all that shit. How's your boyfriend? How's your week? All this short, like, you know, just nonsense small talk that no one really gives a fuck about right doesn't really go anywhere not really digging deep into actually knowing you and trying to understand you and build a connection it's just kind of pleasantries um so there's that pretend warmth and then sometimes if you're new you can think that they're actually your friends but they're not and what you realize quickly when you move to the uk there's that thing that's i think most um expats realize when they come here there's that awakening after work so you're at work, you know, you have you have a lot of banter with your colleagues, you're talking at the coffee machine, you're exchanging fucking emojis on fucking Slack, you get lunch together, you're laughing, you're joking, but as soon as it's time to clock off, everyone scurries away like fucking cockroaches when someone opens the door. They all fucking scatter. 
They don't want to know you at all. You know what I mean? If, even if they're at the same station at you, they fucking turn away. They make it very obvious they don't want to talk to you. It's very interesting because you're like, wow, what, what changed? At work, we were best friends. As soon as you stepped, as soon as it kind of was, was fucking home time, you forgot I fucking existed. And that's the fake sort of like friendship co- in the things that exist here in fucking um, in the UK. So it seems like in Berlin, it's the opposite. People aren't cold, they're honest. So if they actually want to be your friend and they think you're cool, they're going to let you know. And then um, obviously because they are really honest or maybe because they're cold, maybe because they have a higher barrier of entry to be somebody's friend there, when you do, you know, jump over those fucking barriers and you earn their trust, they are friend for life, right? I can understand that being a thing too. Once you find people that you share a lot of common, you share a lot of common with, you're not going to let them go. It makes a lot of sense. Another one says, while well, she really described it so well, resonated with my experience eight years ago. Over the years, Berlin became a happy place because I found myself there. You have to make your own happiness. So well said. Exactly. I believe that. Another one says, Berlin, individual, um, apathetic hell. Everybody claims to be a leftist, but zero solidarity. I want to vomit. Yeah, I don't think that's true. I think there's a lot of solidarity when it comes to protesting because, um, you know, we've seen it so far with the, um, you know, with the fucking um, pro-Palestine protests that they've been having there they've been really turning up so big up everybody um over there in berlin turning up and of course free palestine until the death it continues unfortunately she didn't understand berlin concept of living yes no one gives a fuck how and what lifestyle you have obviously but berlin's are very friendly and open if you need help and of course you can make many friends here just the clubs are probably not the best place to make friends connecting with people in their language will be helpful uh that's at least my experience yes yeah, true that's true um all your friends shouldn't be you know centered around fucking club life that makes a lot of sense but i think to be fair though that's one of the things i liked about that city i think like i think a great city my my marker of a great city because i think london is such a bad city my marker as a great city is that can you have your own little experience without the city imposing things for you to do and i feel like london kind of forces you to go to bars and to restaurants to drink there's no other else no there's no there's not much to do outside of that even benches there's not a lot of benches to sit down and chill out if you unless you go to like places in central london like maybe our art galleries are really good and a lot of them are free but there's not a lot of things to do outside of eating and drinking whereas i feel like in berlin and other great cities you can do loads of things for free in the open that don't revolve around drinking and eating and i think that's a marker of a good city where you can go to you can literally go to berlin for a weekend and not see a single club and you have a great time you know and not have a drop of alcohol and you'd have a great time i've done it before myself i think that's possible i think that's a real marker of a great city um i feel like the germans haven't been able to keep up culture and friendships customs like other countries since the wars <laughs> this oh this she's getting deep um and this interpersonal distance resonates through german society um affecting all sorts of people germans are super warm-hearted sensitive people but they crush their culture and maybe this is what is left sorry if this opinion is mega strange i'm half awake and overworked but all in super but all in i super relate to the woman in the video okay interesting perspective another one says um something in german what she's saying here something about language right another train that nobody needs and wants in circle of friends probably not a real berliner but just a lot of uprooted and loved people jesus man, that's rude that's rude isn't it just a lot of uprooted and unloved people from all over the road <laughs> wow it's, it's good to see what actual german people think of of what actual berliners think of um ravers and stuff people that move there don't learn the language they think of you us all uprooted unloved people <laughs> <laughs> this one says drugs raves and fucked up lifestyle the whole country is like to describe it come to munich dear to see what to see what's coldness yeah true people say cold, munich is hor- i think munich is like the essex of fucking germany right allegedly um berlin is the worst shithole we need her ted talk so yeah big up her she did amazing i enjoyed it i fucking enjoyed it moving on from that moving on from that we got this post here courtesy of over and under we got this post here courtesy of over and under i for one don't find this humorous i'm not gonna lie just because it illustrates how desperate sneakerheads are for trainers and what they will do just to get them and i feel like this is a post from over and under so the store in mexico made the winners dress up as powerpuff girls to pick up their pair so there was these powerpuff dunk sbs that came out recently and it went in raffle and this i guess this um skate shop somewhere in mexico made the raffle winners have to dress up as powerpuff girls to pick up their shoe successfully 
and in my opinion i feel i think i find this incredibly humiliating and i also find this to be a representative of just how far sneakheads will go to get shoes i said it earlier i think on twitter that i honestly do think if you said if you told a sneakerhead to go down on their mum to secure a pair of hype sneakers i think they'd do it i think if you told a reseller a sneakerhead that you would give them the shoe for retail if they licked out their mum they would fucking do it at a heart in a fucking heartbeat even if their mum didn't want to do it they do it by fucking force sneakerheads are fucking pathetic i think in some respects the way they fucking bend and kowtow to sneaker companies and the way they suck up to them for the shoes, the way they let them get away with fucking murder, Nike being a biggest proponent of it, right, over the years. Um, the fact that, for whatever reason, sneaker culture has become like a billion-dollar industry um, and for some reason they continue to create these artificial levels of scarcity. They don't need to make limited edition shoes. They could easily make enough shoes to satisfy demand, but they purposely create... Um, artificial scarcity to make people queue outside to make people fucking fight for raffle entries to fight in queues fight each other in the fucking queues physically stab each other kill each other right um inflate the fucking resale market make people fucking remortgage their house and buy fucking shoes it's awful these brands get away with fucking murder and nobody fucking says anything about it because they just want the shoes they all want the shoes and look at this, this guy's willing to fucking embarrass himself, turn up to this Mexico store wearing a Powerpuff outfit with these fucking man tatters out, like, for the shoe. Like, honestly, is there no, do you have no pride? Do you have no self-worth? Are you not embarrassed? This is what you'll be willing to do for shoes. If you're willing to do this for shoes, it's not without a reason that you would fucking lick out your mum for a pair of shoes. If they said, hey, go down your, go down on your mum, and I'll give you a pair of fucking Jordan 11s. I'll give you a pair of bread reimagined fours, right? They will probably do it. It's utterly embarrassing. It really is. I don't know why this triggered me so much, but it, I know it's just fun. It probably doesn't sort that deep and it's lighthearted. But for me, it's proof that sneakheads will do just about anything to get their shoes. So this is proof. This is fucking Mexico. This isn't even like in America or somewhere or here in the UK. This is Mexico. And this is proof that that sneakerhead desperation is something that exists everywhere in any fucking location and i absolutely hate it i really do and i think the dunks are fucking terrible anyway they're not even that good the best thing about the dunk is the fucking heel tab with the eye on it the rest of it is fucking shit they're not even that good they're not even good enough to warrant getting dressed up like this like what is this honestly horrendous man horrendous i fucking hate it all i hate it i hate it i hate it all and then of course to make it worse We've got this video courtesy of Over and Under that features a skate shop called Crook Skate Shop. And skate shops do this often, right? Where they will have guys in the store purposely break the boxes like this to not encourage people to resell. Because I guess the idea is Dunk SBs are made to skateboard in and they don't want resellers. They hate resellers. So they'll go and break up the boxes. So when you're buying the shoes, you can't resell them but the thing is that's really dumb and i believe something i've never understood is this is that this is so corny and lame is that most skater owned sneaker shops most skater owned sneaker shops most sos from what i've understood they're being propped up and the reason why they're still in business is because of fucking sneakerheads and resellers if these guys didn't have dunk sb accounts or sb accounts where they could fucking sell limited edition shoes no one will give a fuck about them most of those stores go under, especially the ones that lose their Nike SB accounts. So it's kind of funny that they purposely mock and spit in the faces of sneakerheads when those are the people who are keeping a roof over their heads. Those are the ones who are allowing their kids to go to whatever schools they're going to or pay for their vacations or their fucking joints and shit that they smoke in the back. Like it's fucking weirdly disrespectful and also doesn't address the issue. The issue is, you know, how to keep those independent skate shops open and shit and help and, and keep them open to serve the community and obviously have them be in a position where they're not beholden or dependent on a conglomerate like fucking or corp mega corporation like Nike that forces them to buy shoes that they don't want. Because another thing I've heard also, I don't know if it's the same thing, but I did hear that if you've got a, Nike, if you've got a skateboarding shop and you want to have a Nike SB account, I've heard that if you want limited edition shoes, they purposely make you buy a ton of core shoes. So if you want the, all the limited edition shoes like the Powerpuff Dunks, they'll make you buy all the black and white basic dunks they release and all the other SB shoes they have under their range. And obviously if you're a skate shop, 
no one wants those basic SBs unless you skate. But most skaters will buy other skate shop, other skateboarding brands to wear, right? Specific ones, maybe Lakai, maybe DC, maybe Vans, whatever. But they're not going to buy SBs for the most part unless you get seeded. You don't really see a lot of skateboarders buying SBs really outside of the ones that get them seeded and shit, right? Um, they will mostly wear skateboarding brands. So you get skate shops that want limited edition shoes to bring foot traffic into their stores, but they get forced to buy core GR stuff. The core GR stuff is way more plentiful than the limited edition stuff. The core GR stuff doesn't sell because skateboarders don't wear SBs for the most part. Um, and then the sneakerheads who you want to come through your door to buy the limited edition shoes and you hope will get into skateboarding, they don't want anything else. When sneakerheads go in to buy SBs, they just buy the SBs and they leave. They don't want decks. They don't want grip. They don't want tape. They don't want fucking... Um, nuts and bolts and shit they don't give a fuck or tools all they want is the fucking sb so it doesn't even work as a way to kind of acquire new customers because sneakerheads and resellers are not into skateboarding whatsoever they may be adjacent they may share some commonalities and shit there may be some crossover but there's nothing um that interests sneakerheads into skateboarding and there's nothing that skateboarders will be interested in when it comes to sneakerheads so i just find it utter disrespectful they do is because i feel like again sneakerheads are the reason why these guys have businesses and they're able to keep roof over their heads and their issue really isn't with sneakers and resellers it should be with the brands the brands are the ones that create the artificial scarcity that makes sb so valuable and that drives up their value um, and that makes them want to buy them and resell them it's the brands that do it not the fucking resellers the brands could easily com in completely eradicate the resale market if they just made more shoes now that i'm seeking issues a billion dollar industry there's no excuse make more shoes but they don't make them because guess what they enjoy the hype they enjoy the click they enjoy the engagement they enjoy all the fanfare and all the free marketing that comes with it and all this noise so i find this incredibly lame it's incredibly shit the same way that i find when skate shops back in the day would make people you know do kick flips and sbs um to get the shoes and shit it's like or doing ollie and shit it's like go fuck off mate i'm not gonna be a performing monkey to buy shoes i'm not gonna fucking dress up as a powerpuff girl to pick up a pair of shoes go go get fucked you know what i mean it's not that serious and if you ask me again i might slap you in the face with the fucking shoe itself but anyway i don't know why it makes me angry but i fucking hate it i fucking hate it i swear i swear <sighs> Anyway, moving on. We've got this link. Um, sorry to talk about courtesy of Este Commune. Um, this party that I've wanted to go to for a while, um, has they're going to have their next rave in Fold. So they had one recently in Amsterdam um, just before just i think last week actually if i'm not mistaken on a sunday usually when their raves are but they're going to have one on the 17th of february at fold this is kind of really really big news so this is a collective based out of amsterdam um they're founded or mostly known by uh maron and obviously um in recent years Rene wise has been closely associated with them also um he also kind of plays there and of course you know you, you guys will know that i'm a big 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 fan of Rene wise definitely part of the Rene wise fine club and shit and i've seen him play a bunch of times so it's good to see that they're going to be doing an event in fold and obviously fold being the best club we have here in london it's going to be cool to see them and to see what they're going to do to that space will there be any tweaks um in terms of entry and all this stuff in terms of maybe the sound system who they're going to have playing and shit because usually they don't um print announce a lineup beforehand it's all going to be cool so i'm really looking forward to it and again um, i was looking forward to going to amsterdam to go do, see it in actual its location in situ which i will obviously will still do but it's a good to kind of tick off the list because i've got to I've, of all the kind of next quote-unquote cool hyped parties to go to um i'm going to be going to multi-sex i think in march next one in berlin happening so that's a that's a that, that's a big one that people are kind of talking about a lot now um they've been going for a while and stuff but they do some really cool raves out i think it's in watergate if i'm not mistaken and of course there's Erste commune that happens out there in amsterdam and obviously they're gonna do an event here in fold but obviously i'm gonna be trying to go to their event in amsterdam when it happens to because it's good to see them in situ but the caption here courtesy of Erste commune instagram account says we are coming to london and thrilled to have a big uh, free to have the bird land in fold um, we are a series of events um, from amsterdam centered around community and music our residence includes a moral flaws hitman inges flints maron renee wise and winfer and a diverse mix who share a common commu commitment to our musical values fucking love it as per our tradition we keep the lineup unannounced creating an element of surprise this trust-based approach encourages our audiences to attend confident in the quality of the music as the community unfold saturday february the 17th from 10 to 6 a.m and best believe i'm gonna be on that fucking platform 
I'm going to be on that fucking platform to the left of the fucking, to the right of the decks, to the left if you're fucking walking there to the stage, from the minute one to the end of that fucking rave. Trust and believe. I'm going to be there with my big fat Spice Girls boots, my big fat fucking um, New Rock boots on that fucking platform going crazy from fucking 10 till 6 a.m. I can't wait. Um, in keeping with regular events in Amsterdam, the majority of the tickets will be sold at the door. However, we have made a limited amount available now to purchase via the link. If you don't have a financial capacity to purchase a regular ticket, please reach out, which is pretty sick, isn't it, right? They have an ability to like give people tickets um, if they can't afford them and shit. That's really nice. Um, community aspect about it. Unannounced um, guests and shit no idea what the lineup is going to be but it's definitely going to be fucking hard can't wait can't fucking wait big up Erste Kamine moving on from Erste Kamine we have to talk about E1 again we have to talk about E1 again so E1 in London has become a hot button topic in nightlife with clubs and shit because it's been getting a little bad rep um, justifiably so I think because it legitimately like I've said before might be the best and worst club in London it might be the best and worst club in London because it's the best because it has some of the best lineups we have on any given weekend outside of fold i think in terms of a breadth artist from covering from edm from tech house melodic house to techno to disco no disco i don't think they don't do but in general they cover most of the big genres and they have a stacked lineup and usually it's open until six so if you want to go to a nightclub in london that's open until 6 a.m that also covers a huge range of genres that has some of the biggest djs playing in a big in two big rooms then obviously e1 is a place to go but unfortunately, it has some very big negatives, right? The security are incredibly heavy-handed. The queue system is a bit of an is a bit annoying. The security itself, in terms of being searched, is really intrusive. Um, the place itself is incredibly warm. There's no air conditioning. It's incredibly sweaty inside there. The sound is a bit overrated. They're only really loud if you go to the front. And just in general, it's a fucking hellscape when it comes to the cus punters that go there. It attracts a very dodgy crowd because they don't have any you know there's no door picking at the door apart from just don't arrive there drunk or like smashed and you'll get in but there's no real door selection door picking there so just about everybody that has money can go in there which obviously creates a bit of a weird environment and maybe because of the range of acts they have there that cover such a broad range of you know dance music or electronic music it means that you have so many different types of people coming in at once so it's not there's no real commonality in the personality and shit it's all kind of all over the place um, and obviously that kind of leads to some issues especially when it comes to the age thing because a lot of the kids that go there sometimes can be a little bit you know rambunctious and shit but in general it's a fucking hellscape but people online have been letting people know in detail how terrible it is and there's been some weird wild threads on reddit recently this once um, from 15 days ago says e1 is awful again and this one in particular says do not go to e1 so we're going to read a few of these posts and see what people are saying about e1 because i've i've long said this before myself but i think i was one of the first vocal voices out there that said hey e one's a bit shit in it and unfortunately for e1 or for, unfortunately for people like myself that complain e1 is terrible but they still have some of the best lineups in london so even though i'm reading what i'm reading most likely i'll be there again you know in a weekend coming up very soon most likely new year's day so all this stuff all this shit that i'm talking about fucking e1 matters none because most likely i will be there once again because the lineups are just too fucking impressive but let's read some of the complaints this one says e1 is awful again Posting this here as I read negative reviews from the more grab post last week and I wanted to highlight that not only had nothing changed but he had gotten worse. <laughs> I heard before that I went to E1 that it could be maxed out venue. However, I want to stress that my experience was that was that bad if one one person to put off from going there from this point. The Mix Mag Over Mono event was the most oversold, dangerous event I've ever attended and was quite literally the perfect storm of a tragedy to happen. E1 really is a horrific venue. Only seven male toilets for a crowd of 1,000 people. <laughs> I didn't think about that. Actually. That's a very good point. Seven toilets for 1,000 people. And best believe people are either in there doing, you know, having fucking drug shits which are fucking st you've never you've never smelled a worse shit unless you've been in the toilet after someone's done drugs and they've had a shit drug shit smells so fucking bad so either they're doing drug shits or they're doing drugs in there so when you go in their toilets you're gonna you're gonna have an experience one way or the other um 
Only one seven male toilets for a crowd of 1,000 plus. Only two doors for each stage, leading to bottlenecking and crushing, and crushing at peak times of entry. After turning up at midnight, it took me 90 minutes. 90 minutes in an incredibly packed crowd and this can't be understressed how busy and packed it was to get in and put my jacket away even the second room was absolutely rammed during Overmono's set this event was not just oversold by one to two thousand but by at least 500 plus so this person's alleging that they might have oversold the event by 500 <laughs> it's not it's also not even mentioning the problem that this club is has with the crowd it can attract rude it can attract and rude staff if E1 is, has one hater, I am that hater. If it has no haters, I am no longer alive. Exactly. That's definitely what I'm saying. But the thing about the rude staff, which I'll give them a bit of a bligh with, I think working in a nightclub is probably one of the most thankless jobs anyway, right? It's definitely not a great job. I've worked in bars for a long, for a small period of time and it's very hard to, to be a good bartender because you do encounter some fucking scoundrels. But I think nightclubs might be a level above like being a bartender in a nightclub you must meet some absolute fucking cunts the worst of humanity turn up at night like my parents always used to say nothing really good happens you know after 9 p.m and it's true really even though i go to raves a lot and i party and stuff all the worst things that have happened in my life have definitely happened to me after 9 p.m <laughs> so can you imagine being sober and working in a nightclub and having to talk to fucking and communicate with fucking ravers and people are drunk and high and shit so i think if you work in a nightclub it's pretty hard not to be rude when you are surrounded by drunk and high people who are constantly repeating their orders to you touching you talking to you rude throwing their money at you whistling clicking it like just being an annoying and whatever it can be hard not to be rude so i think the rude thing is whatever but for me it's just the security it's too much you go to honestly. I've seen. I've, I think I've seen more security at E One than, than I see at fucking Stansted. There's more security at E One than fucking Stansted, and they're ready to throw down. They look like they're ready to go. They're ready to. They're ready to fucking throw down if you say something. Like, and the search is aggressive, bro. They search every fucking cranny of your bag, every fucking cr every fucking crevice of your fucking body. It's a complete fucking vibe killer. Um, what are you guys saying? You know, I think uh big up robert henry parrot salute to az here to help us keep entertained with while the pause deal with the redactors of this crazy well, exactly big up big up big up robert henry parrot uh, uh, uh what you're gonna appreciate you appreciate you appreciate you appreciate you and big up half moon bardo too love agos best lur best been lurking i think um listening material oh sorry best lurking and listening material uh keep it up g keep it coming g okay thank you so much half moon bardo appreciate you bro appreciate you um let's continue um no i think fuck jerome Menrick, um when they say seven toilets they mean seven actual toilets i think the stalls are what they are I, I, from when i've been to e1 i think you can maybe fit five people in the stalls it's like a it's one of those like metal ones it's not like individual it's like one of those big metal ones um but there's only seven toilets with doors with sorry seven toilets with doors and a lock it continues here um some comments very important to raise these issues. Unfortunately, club owners, promoters, greed goes. This issue should be raised by the HSE. Um, another one says here, I'm, compl I'm, compl I'm compelled to chime in and back up what you're saying. My friend was in tears uh, in the crush trying to get into Overmono set and it was somehow only got worse up the, uh, from there. Copy and paste in my Google review. Easily the worst night out I've had in London. Probably the worst night out of my life. Roughly 1.5 times oversold. Went to see Overmono and you physically couldn't get in the door to the main room. Thanks for the free beer, but that's not worth a £30 ticket. Oh, by the way, the, the reason why they mention this is because fucking E1, which is really dodgy to do this because I don't think this is... I don't think this is... um, This is legal. Allegedly, E1 give people free tickets and free drink tokens if they go and they leave a good good google review or they leave or they tell you basically here's a free ticket and a drink token give us a google review because i guess the google reviews for e1 are terrible so they're trying to counteract it and have people go there and you know whatever but it's like isn't that a bit that sounds a bit illegal isn't it that you're basically bribing people with free entry and fucking drink tokens to leave you google reviews or positive ones is a bit it sounds a bit dodgy to be fair um spoke to tons of instead of just and the funny thing about it instead of just like addressing the issues people are having you're just bribing them with drinks and free entry why don't you just sort the issues out 
Why not just like install bare air conditioning? Why not have different entry and exit points? Why not simplify the entry process? Why not maybe half the security? Why not have a door picking introduced there? Because they still make a ton of money. They still sell a bunch of tickets. Just have door pickers. It's not that hard, really, to, to, to kind of change the mood of the place a little bit. But anyway, what do I know? It continues. Spoke to tons of people. Virtually all of them were there for the first time because if you went there, you would never go back. <laughs> Four can for the for a can of water in the main room and no tap water. You can go for another bar to get tap water, but you can't physically get back in the main room. So they either stamp up or get out. Jesus Christ. Imagine paying four pounds for water. Fuck off. Never written a Google review before, but this experience was so bad I felt compelled to. Shout out to the staff there who were doing their best with the shite hand that they were dealt with. Please go to smaller venues in London that care about the experience and need your money. That's very, very true. That's very, very, very true. And someone's saying here, the best two clubs in London are folding Corsica Studios. I've had a bit of a I've purposely been on a bit of a break from going to Fold. I've been going there for too long. Obviously, I've spoken about it glowingly on this podcast many a times. And obviously, it's still the best club in London. But I feel like sometimes going to the same place all the time is a bit boring. Do you know what I mean? But unfortunately, it really is the only place to go to. Unfortunately, the only places really to actually go to, club-wise, I would recommend if you're in London, will probably be Fold, Venue MOT, and maybe the Colour Factory. And actually, The Yard. The Yard and the Colour Factory in Hackney Wick, they're really good, very underrated. They're not open super late though. And of course, um, Venue MOT um, and of course, Fold. But going to Fold every single weekend, going to the same club every weekend, even if it's really good. Like if I lived in Berlin, I wouldn't just be going to Berghain every weekend. It's just kind of boring. But unfortunately, when you go to places like E1, you realise why you go to Fold because E1 is so terrible. So, so, so fucking terrible. It kind of beggars belief. So the other post someone posted is this. Don't go to E1. Went to the fourth anniversary mainly to see Overmono and Flynn. And O'Flynn. O'Flynn's se second biggest name on the roster. Opened the smallest stage from 12 to 10. 12 to 2. Uh, doors open at 11. It was absolutely heaving for O'Flynn. So 45 minutes short of his set finishing. A lot of myself included. Moved to the main room to get a good sport um, for fucking Overmono. So this guy is saying that O'Flynn is a big name as well and he had a way too of an earlier set, right? Imagine you're playing at fucking 12 to 2. So you're getting people piling in really early to see one of the co main headliners play a set one hour into the opening. Like, <laughs> that's not really good at crowd management, is it? Um, it was absolutely heaving for O'Flynn. So 45 minutes short of his set, finishing a lot of a lot of us, including myself, moved to the main room to get a good spot for Overmono. This room was already uh, absolutely heaving. You could barely move, even three quarters of us of the way to the back of the room. It was it got busier and busier by the minute, and it was seriously dangerous. It was outrageously hot, so no one could move. Literally no movement. And I've been to all the stages at SC Corner at Glasgow. Crushes were happening. Girls were worried for their safety, and it was until ultimately incredibly dangerous. Jesus Christ! We left after forty five minutes of the overmono because of how unpleasant it was. There was nowhere to get a space other than the stage, packed smoking area, ridiculous security, unhelpful and unprofessional, and not even going to bother talking about the outrage just queues for the toilets cloakroom and bars 450 it's now 450 for a can of water they bumped up by, by 50 pence because they don't have potential to kill somebody don't go there you know what's going to happen someone's gonna have to die unfortunately similar to fabric fabric never got a handle on the punters that went there never really got a handle on the drug situation their security whatever and they had to get to a point where people died and they you know they essentially nearly lost their license and were going to get closed down and then people kind of protested and now they're back open again and i think someone died there recently too but they're still open i'm not really sure, sure how but e1's gonna have something tragic happen and then they're gonna wake up it's gonna be too late It'd be nice if they just kind of paid attention and heeded the warnings of the partners now because there's probably an element of these people who are being a little bit dramatic and being a little bit, you know, whatever. You can maybe say that. Maybe there's an element of being a true dramatic because it's like, you know, what do you expect when you're going to see Overmono playing in a place like E1? Of course, he's going to be in demand, right? He's one of the, the biggest fucking acts out here, right? Or they're one of some, they're some of the biggest acts out here when it comes to um, dance music. So maybe there's an element of drama, an element of, you know, whatever, exaggeration. But there is some truth in what people are saying. And if you just address it and kind of deal with these issues before it gets worse or before it gets fatal, it can save a lot of trouble. But unfortunately, especially in nightlife, people don't really change course until they have to. 
right? Like until the sound system breaks, that's when they fucking think of fixing it. So most likely someone will unfortunately get really hurt, potentially maybe even pass away and then they'll wake up and by then it might be too late which is really sad to see. Um, people are saying, yeah, fuck supporting the venue that doesn't even provide free water for dancers. Exactly, exactly. Imagine not having free water. For, no, I'm not mistaken. I don't think that's true. I think there's one place that you're not allowed to, you can't get water. I think the bars you can get water from is the one in, um, oh, where is it? It's the second room. Or maybe it's the first bar. I think there's partic- there's one particular bar you can get water from. I think it might be the I think it might be the bar which is across from the toilets. That's in a little like kind of corridor area. I think that's where you can get the free water from. They usually got a little tanker there on the side of the bar. So maybe that's what they're doing. Or maybe what they're doing is really scummy. Maybe they're not they're not telling you where the free bar is, where the free water bar is, but they're just telling you you can only buy water here. That's probably what they're doing. They don't want people to go out to go get free water. They want you to buy the can of water because it's obviously four fifty in their fucking tills, isn't it? Um, we'll see some other comments here. What people saying? I was at E one for the opening party in twenty eighteen, and it was pretty much the same. So it's been the same since twenty eighteen. This person's alleging. See, I told you, someone's gonna have to die, and then they're gonna learn. But then it'd be too late. They blocked off the access of the main room and it was a one in one out. So people were queuing in the second room to get into the main room. <laughs> At least there was no crashes, but I distinctly remember thinking their organizers are in over their heads and never went back. Scary to think that they haven't figured it out half, half a decade later. Another one says, completely echoed this. We just got in back from the room, back, sorry, we just got into the back of the room five minutes before Overmona started and we left as we were completely squashed. Wow. I've never been to E1 where that main room is full to that extent. So they're saying E1, that main room is really big. It might be like, I don't know, a thousand capacity. They're saying that main room was full from the front to the back. Because usually when you when I go to people play at E1, it usually is only full from the end of the bar all the way to the front of the DJ booth. So for it to be full, the entire thing must have meant there were some there were loads of fucking individuals in that place. I'm glad we left the set then, as I'm not sure we would have gotten out of the room later. It was oversold. I traveled down from Manchester for it. Have complained to RA who have passed it on to Mix. <laughs> complained to RA. What's that going to do? That's hilarious. What's that going to do? What's RA going to do about it? And it's on Mix Mag as to have whether to issue a refund. Um, the bar in the main room. Also, uh, E1 is owned by Mix Mag. Is that why? Interesting. Or did Mix Mag put on the event? Huh. Why would you complain to RA to get a refund from Mixmag? Why don't you just go straight to Mixmag? Anyway, the bar in the main room was only sold cans of water, sent you to a different bar to tap water, which meant battling through the massive crowd. Mixmag just wanted money and had absolutely no regard for anyone's safety. When we pushed out of the Overmona room, there was girls literally screaming, I just want to get out. They physically put them, push their way in the crowd. I saw someone on Twitter say, and I'll take this with a pinch of salt, that one of the bar staff said to them, the max capacity is usually 1,600 and they sold 2,300. That's pure greed, isn't it? That is capitalism in full effect, isn't it? Instead of looking out for the safety of the ravers, because you're still making a killing on 1,600, let's make more money by selling 2,000 tickets. Oh my God, bro. Oh my God. Another one says here, um, been there a couple of times years ago and even though it wasn't that busy, I just didn't like the venue. It felt soulless. Exactly. That's what it feels about it. There's no residence there. There's no real like, I don't know. You There's no like, there's no continue. I don't think there's a residence type of in-house party thing they do either to be fair. The closest thing they've got is the E1 present sort of thing. They kind of in-house promotion thing, but they don't really have resident DJs. There's no local promoters putting on raves there all the time because it's just too big. It's hard to kind of make that work on a monthly basis or even bi-monthly. Um, but yeah, that's probably why it feels soulless also. And also it's, in the, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere where it is. It's kind of, is it kind of whopping I'm saying station-wise? I mean, London, it's kind of hard to describe if you're not from London, but it's kind of like in a, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, there's not a lot of like um, community around there either to be fair. So I might part, part of it. Another one says, yeah, the uh, one and only time I went to E1 was to see Helena Half in 2019 and exactly the same thing happened unbelievably packed crowds crushing against each other and the line for the women's was about three thousand years long <laughs> someone wiped their snot on me <laughs> holy shit someone wiped their snot on me holy fuck i bet people were shitting on the dance floor too i bet people were pissing and shitting on the dance floor if there's only seven cubicles and a, a urinal that only fits five guys and there's one there's two thousand three hundred people there i'm probably sure 
some people were shitting and pissing in corners. Can you imagine seeing that stuff in the morning as a cleaner? As a Londoner, I never go to E1 for a night out as I just can't trust it and it won't be the same. Apparently, their head office is in shambles, which I totally can see. Yeah, of course. Can you imagine what the E1 head office looks like? It's probably just a, a room full of, covered in fucking ket and cocaine. That's what fucking I imagine when I see E1 fucking head office. I imagine guys with like, you know, tattoos, you know, blacked out sleeves and rings around their arms and line tattoos and shit, right? And drop crotch pants and dangly bits of earrings and stuff and just like powder everywhere everyone sniffing <laughs> i went to london for 10 days recently and visited seven clubs e1 was the worst experience by a long shot op describes all of these issues with it as well i was so disappointed by how overpacked it was um the passageways between the rooms was uh were also tiny choke points with people pushing to get through i found the design to be awful the only men's restroom i could find that had free working urinals for a very long line of people i was surprised that it was rated so highly on dj mag's top 100 but it made total sense when i realized the similar experience to new york's top rated dj 100 clubs as well exactly 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 um but the one thing i've kind of been curious about is the new year's eve events or new year's day events because last time i checked i don't know what happened but helen the health was meant to be playing all night long on the 31st or sorry on the 1st of january but somehow it's changed now and it's not the case i don't know what actually is going on but it keeps on changing the lineup and i don't know what the deal is because now it's changed and it's loads of people in the i don't know if it's like helen the half backed out of doing the the all night long affair that she was meant to be doing there because i was wanting to go to that or has it always been this because now i'm looking at the lineup here on ra it says e1 and percolate 30 hour party for the new year's eve and new year's day and again it's a bad idea for me to go there right i read all those accounts right i read all these fucking accounts on reddit talking about how horrible it is but unfortunately like i said e1 is the best and worst club in london the the worst or the worst and best the worst because of everything everyone said and the best because it's the only place you can get these type of lineups there apart from maybe fold so for new year's eve the lineup is job jose um job jobsy sorry um midland um leon vinehall Bam bambuno nicks reese spooner soon um was that suny man and Craylord and Farmer, Yasin, Keyman and Chapel Chalk. And in the NYD or Chapel Walk, sorry, NYD New Year's Day, daytime event, you've got Dax J, DVS1, Maron, um, B uh, Blasher and Alout, uh, and Antonio D Iglesias, Pre Silent, Head and the Half. So the Head and the Half thing is part of a New Year's Day lineup. So she's not playing all night long anymore. I don't know what's happening. I don't know what the deal is there. Why did that change? I'm pretty sure I saw a lineup that had Helen the Half playing all night long for New Year's Day, which I wanted to go to to see her play because she's an amazing DJ. But now it's like all these other people playing. It's like, I don't really care. So yeah, so I think I might just sack this off and stick with fucking, um, and stick with Hotbox because Hotbox have got a rave on on New Year's Day. So that might be a place I might go to. Unfortunately, Hotbox is sold out if you wanted the ticket. So that's not going to happen. But yeah, um, E1, um again nothing will change i don't think until they want to change and i think they only will change when somebody passes away that's my unfortunate prediction someone will someone will pass away and then they'll end up changing but it'll be too late so um you know i guess just enjoy it as you can really but yeah you've been warned you have been warned and i think to be honest most of you will understand if you've been to a shitty club it's got its good points but i think the, for the most part the entry again is a vibe killer with the security and the searching and of course if it's a busy night you're waiting in the queue for ages and then of course the bars are really expensive um you know um there's no free water in some some of the bars you have to leave to go to another room to go get it and shit um, the toilets are fucking horrendous like i said like if, if somebody's not in there doing coke shits they're in there doing fucking coke and they're taking fucking ages so you're standing in the in, in the line for ages the urinals are horrible right there's full of fucking liquid everywhere so that kind of make you grow so it's a tough place to go to maybe you have to before you go piss somewhere else because it's a tough place to go to anyway moving on um i want to talk about quickly nicholas rose i'm not sure if you guys know who this guy is but i think i covered him previously because he went on a weird tirade rampage against river sudus which is now called rso is that, is that rso now right yes yeah, rso so river sudus is rso now formerly grish muller a club in berlin and this guy called nicholas rose had some complaints about it during the pandemic and basically i think he said that um this club in berlin was racist and homophobic which is quite a wild statement 
because, you know, nightclubs in Berlin are known for how welcoming and open and free they are, right? So to accuse a nightclub, especially a one so legendary like River Sudus and whatever else may be, and a team around it of being racist and homophobic, people didn't really buy it, right? And it was a bit of a weird one. Um, but obviously he made his, he made his point um, about what happened there. And went, uh, anyway, he's back again. Nicholas Rose is back again. So this is the first video of him um, some time ago, courtesy of the account Rave Don't Stop. And, you know, him talking about River Sudus and how he had a bad time there. Um, let me actually play a little bit of it so you can hear what he says. And then I'll play the new one because he's back again with another complaint because now he's moved to Amsterdam. Um, he's moved to Amsterdam now and now he's trying to cancel clubs in Amsterdam. So Berlin wasn't enough. He already left his uh, trail of dead bodies and clubs over there and got people fired. And I think if I'm not mistaken, when he did a complaint about River Sudus, they closed for a while. They fired some security. They hired new people. Like he completely changed that place. Like he flipped it. Maybe for the better, who knows? Because I'm not really there. But I found these complaints to be a little bit dramatic, maybe a little bit you know full of lies <laughs> maybe a little bit victimy and shit but hey um, this is his complaint when he first went there hey everybody so today i'm going to talk about my experience at the new gleese mula at the sinoid party uh a few days ago it was disgusting what <laughs> i dealt with and i think that it is very important that as many people as possible hear what i went through and experience me 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 because based on my identity and just who i am I've experienced a lot of things that the average cis white person probably wouldn't even have nightmares about experiencing. <laughs> I wrote out a little bit of some notes to just keep things in proper chronological order. I'm going to keep it pretty cut and dry so you get the facts and it's up to you to decide how you feel about it. And the funny thing is, soon after this, he did an interview with Playful magazine. I think I spoke about it on here where he spoke about his um, GHB addiction. Ross, it's been two and a half years that you have been taking GHB for two years two years and one month two, two years, years and, and one, one month, month I yeah about two years and one month and then you got enough yes and quit yes I got sick of my shit yeah <laughs> basically so what happened like how was wh when did you try it for the first time or I first tried G when I was um I believe this was, yeah, this was August 2020. This is when I was in a party setting and I had just tried, like, okay, let's see, whatever. Some people giving me um, tips or their own experiences, but nothing too, too negative, actually. Coming from people who are taking the drug, <laughs> you're not really, <laughs> you know, you're just hearing kind of the, the good things that it will make you feel and not necessarily being educated at all about the dark side of it. Yeah, and this is like the one drug that you though here about in berlin that is like it's a banned from all clubs it's banned from all clubs but that you had already heard i guess i had already heard that yeah. too but then yes. the people who were taking it you were like well Absolutely. they handled their shit yes so people handled their shit and um uh, people always find ways to bring things into places so the responsibility everybody must take responsibility for the drugs that they're using and for the energy they bring into the club they also are responsible for the energy that they carry through the party Meaning, yes, take responsibility for you being on a good vibe, but also take responsibility for the fact that your energy is changing and you have to be knowledgeable of that and how it's changing. And I think by taking responsibility, this to me is uh, responsibility is how you are able to respond to something. And there are a lot of moments when people are completely unresponsive to their actions and how they want to fix them. And so they're just like leaving it out. Like this is who I am. Da, 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 da. And that can cause so much chaos. But I think there's also the responsibility people have to opening their mouth and actually providing support to people, even if you don't know them, or if you see that someone's alone or having a hard time or overdosing on G and completely shaky, tremory, sweating, sweating, sweating. Did you know that literally it is only going to take five seconds to get a bottle of water for someone and say, drink some water? Not even asking, just bring it to them. Most of the time, from my experience of doing this, people immediately open up. They also sober up very quickly too. There are a lot of times in these G parties, people would collapse, be completely comatose, and people say they're sleeping. No, they're in a coma. They're in a coma. Put speed up their nose. No, give them water. Give them a lemon. <laughs> Wake them up. 
There's oh, lots good. of time. There's one time, one instance, one of my first five day binges. Oh my god, um, a girl was comatose, and everyone around her was talking so much shit about her. Ah, oh, she can't control herself. She's such a mess. Da, 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 taking too much G. Da, da, da. And I remember, since I was fresh there, I'm like, "What are you guys doing? She can hear you." They're like, "No, she's knocked out." Also, and I'm like, what, yes. "What do you mean she can hear you? Who speaks about a uh, friend who, like that? Or like exactly the people whatsoever. you're literally just with, the person who you're actually." accepting drugs from and they're out and immediately you're hearing all this disgusting this is this is the point that it brings people to and i know people if they go back in time and look at that they probably think how did i get to that point of being so apathetic to the to the reality of life and death all of that gets very watered down Mm -hmm. how much the importance of life and death that becomes almost like nothing and so I remember sitting down with the girl when she was comatose, rubbing her forehead, and I was saying beautiful things. You're beautiful. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Your body is going to recover. You're, the people kept saying, what are you doing? And I'm like, shut up. Get out. I'm like, da da it's going to be all right. An hour later, she wakes up. She's awake, gay. Everyone's like, oh, she's awake. <laughs> it's, it's dark, but, babe, it's real. It's dark, but it's real. It's dark, but it's real. <laughs> and the girl, do you know what she says? She, she stopped the music. Everyone's like, what? She says, you guys are all so fake. Mm. You guys thought I couldn't hear you. Guys, I felt what you guys were saying about me, and that was so hurtful. Nicholas, I could feel you were the only one who took care of me. Am I wrong? And I was like, Oh my God, she actually knew what was happening while she was unconscious. The words people say are so powerful and they carry so much energy. She literally knew people were all saying these things about her because she could feel it in her body when she woke up. But she also knew there was someone there to comfort her that whole time. She's like, I felt like someone was saying something really positive to me during that whole time, though, at the same time. And I was like, she was like, that was you, wasn't it? I was like, yeah, it was. It was. And And were you on G at this time? At that point, yeah, I was, but I also still at this point was able to reason. Whether or not I'm on G, it's not that I become, I actually don't become a nasty person. I just become, I just be, was becoming apathetic, meaning like it was hard for me to get into my emotions. Stop the cap. <laughs> Stop the cap right now. Stop the cap. No boys. And how hard he was going with GHB and how detrimental it was to his you know life and how it fucked up his social group and how he got lost in the source in Berlin which is a common thing it's not just him I think it's a common thing in, in that city people just get lost in the nightlife and you know you could you could maybe think to yourself maybe that was part of the reason why he had such a bad experience maybe that was why he had such a terrible time because he was you know fucked up a lot and he was bumping into people during nightlife and stuff and having bad experiences but you know hey what do I know let's continue between the hours of 3.15 and 4.15 a.m. on August 15th, going into the next day, I attended Sinoid at Glissula. It was fun the first several hours, and around the hour of 4 a.m., it became very fucked up. <laughs> As they were very strict about masks, and that's understandable. But- and again, this is during COVID too. And also put some context in it. This is a Sinoid party, which is one of the most baitest, popular techno raves out there right so and it's always known to having crazy cues very busy a bit of a dodgy crowd so you'd you'd, you'd assume people would be a little bit more forgiving because it's a sinoid rave but not him the way in which they treated me was especially during COVID too. unexplainable as i stood in line for the bathroom to obtain water after dancing several hours i was approached by one of the crew and i told i was not wearing my mask properly as he said that i responded and i haven't even taken off my mask at all he replies that it needs to be a little bit more up. And I explained to him that my nostrils weren't even showing in the slightest. It's pretty much like this. The mask entailed, uh, it went a little bit further down my nose, uh, simply to the point of my nostrils. At that moment, a little bit confused, I replied, okay, I don't see what the issue is, but uh, please explain because it's still in my face. To which he replied, if you wish to drink anything, you have to be sitting down. And my response was, I have been dancing for three hours straight, and I asked if it would be okay if I sat down in this particular spot on the ground and uh, have some water there. He says, okay. So I go ahead and I sit down on the ground to take my water, and I think at this moment he may have taken it as a joke. So I stand up to finish my drink of water before I walk off, and at that moment he opens up a conversation with my friends in German, completely excluding me, (laughs) which does also tend to happen out here. Imagine getting annoyed. That bouncers and security guards in Germ in Berlin, a city in Germany, are speaking German. 
<laughs> imagine taking it as an offense. Imagine thinking that, the, like, imagine taking it as an offense. Imagine getting your back up. Imagine getting pissed off, getting annoyed that people in Germany are speaking German. <laughs> Anyway, long story short, um, he got thrown out of the nightclub and he basically was crying about it because he was like, they threw me out without my coat. I was wearing some really skimpy outfit or something. They didn't care about my state. Blah, blah, blah. But essentially, the crux of the problem was that he wasn't wearing his mask properly during a very you know, heightened, sensitive time during COVID where clubs in Berlin were basically skirting the rules a little bit with the open air parties. So I guess they were hyper sensitive of not fucking up and not getting their clubs closed down because they all kind of needed to stay open to be able to make a living, whatever, and support themselves. So they were very sensitive about making sure people kind of acquiesced to the rules. And I guess one of the rules was you had to have your face mask on and he just didn't have it on appropriately. Instead of just like doing what they said and just acquiescing and making sure that you can make them happy, he started to get into an argument. They didn't like his attitude and they chucked him out. And he saw that as them being homophobic and racist. Nuts, isn't it? Well, anyway, he's back now. He made a new video. And he's in Amsterdam, right? So that's him in Berlin complaining, right? I mean, 2021. And now he's back in Amsterdam trying to get another club shut down, allegedly. Let's hear what he says there. Because I haven't actually watched this yet. But let's hear what he says. Nicholas Rose is back again. Hi, everybody. I bet you're doing good. <laughs> Today I'm going to... Nicholas Rose, the destroyer of nightclubs. Look at him. He's the destroyer of nightclubs. <laughs> They would do a story that has brought a lot of pain to my life and I'm ready to come forward <laughs> and share my testimony about what's been going on with Nicholas Rose the past few months. He loves being a victim. He loves being a victim, bro. He fucking loves it. Share my testimony, you know? Like, bro, it's a nightclub, man. It's not that serious. But again, I don't want to say too much because it's Amsterdam, so I don't know what the scene is like in Amsterdam. Maybe it is racist. I don't know, but... Let's see what he says. Oh, this is going to be brilliant. Share my testimony. <laughs> Since September 24th, 2023, uh -huh. I've never really been the same. He's reading a script. The night I spent at one point dancing my heart out, where I felt so safe, <laughs> turned into a nightmare. <laughs> this took place at the Or party. Okay, the or party, what happened? At one point, this party excited me. Now, whenever yeah. I hear the title or party, I get physically sick to my stomach. Anxiety. <laughs> the the, the drop. He's definitely a performing arts kid. He's definitely a performing arts. He's definitely a theater kid, isn't it? I think he does ballet. I saw pictures of him in Instagram. I think he does like ballet and shit, but he's definitely giving performing arts, isn't it? He's definitely a theater kid, isn't it? The, the, honestly, this is incredible, man. This is incredible and some very serious flashbacks that have haunted me days and nights for almost three months now, and uh -huh. I cannot remain silent anymore. <laughs> Come on, get to the point, then what happened? At his whole party. What happened? I won't remain silent because I am- <laughs> He's forcing himself to cry. Oh, that's shameful. He's forcing himself to cry. A duty to myself and to my community to speak out- No tears, on September by the way. September 24th. No tears. Between 11.45 uh -huh. and 12.40. What happened? I was not only publicly humiliated, but sexually assaulted in front of multiple people <laughs> in the front left area of Brett. So he got humiliated and assaulted. I love how he led with the humiliation first instead of sexual assault. The sexual assault is the most serious, obviously, heinous crime. If that happened, whoever did it to him should get stoned. But leading with the humiliation first is an interesting one, isn't it? Interesting choice. If you've been sexually assaulted, you would say that first. Why would you go to, oh, someone humiliated me? I, don't I really wanted tear. to experience What's partying in a new way this time. <laughs> so I wanted to test my limits by sober raving that night. <laughs> During the time I was being entranced by the incredible music of Maron with a clear and happy mind. Oh, Maron was playing. Oh, no. Maron. Maron. Maron was playing playing his hypnotic groovy um you know genre of techno and somebody took advantage of him let's hear in that moment where i felt absolute freedom and joy it was all snatched away from me from that moment and then on was a few dark months what happened man get to the point what i happened? felt beautiful that night i was wearing a blue, a blue skirt a thong <laughs> and uh some short top Oh, sexy. Look, look at the smile. 
He even smiles at the thought of his outfit that he wore on the day. Yo, this guy's a psycho. If if you got sexually assaulted in that outfit, surely it doesn't have a special place in your heart anymore because it reminds you of a traumatic time in your life, right? You'll probably burn it. You see a little smile. I was wearing this thong and a little out, and he smiled at himself like thinking, I'm a bad bitch. It's like, bruh, didn't that outfit? Anyway. A thong yeah. and uh, some short top. <laughs> That's a maniac. That's the face of a fucking maniac. Honestly, Nicholas, brother, come on, man. You're smiling at the thought of the outfit that you wore that allegedly got you sexually assaulted at a rave while you were sober. I can't imagine a worse experience. It's, you know, there's never a good time to get sexually assaulted, but when you're stone cold sober and then you're smiling at the thought of the outfit. At least I look cute though. It's like. I wore that skirt because it was cute and it let me feel more free. And while dancing, I felt my skirt being lifted up, <laughs> my backside exposed. <laughs> Mind you, I was wearing a thong. <laughs> And then moments later, I felt someone whose hand creep underneath the crevice of my butt, and I felt <laughs> like it was being tapped. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I shouldn't be laughing. I know I shouldn't be laughing. I know, but there's a part of me that doesn't believe him. I, I, I'm a nobody, right? No one gives a fuck what I say, whatever. I'm just a human being showing my appearance on the internet, and I just, I just don't believe him. I'm sorry, man. I don't believe him, man. I don't. I don't believe it happened the way he says it's happening. Like, and the detail is just wild, right? <laughs> this sounds like a fucking... <laughs> this sounds like something that you'd read on fucking, you know, r slash slutty confessions or something on Reddit. <laughs> Touched. In an aggressive way. Mind you, I'm in the very front left corner. And so out of immediate shock and embarrassment, I slapped the hand I found that was up my skirt. Uh-huh. Good. I'll be honest, because of the aggressive nature of this, I did think it was a man. Wrong of me to assume, <laughs> which led to a lot of confusion because I turn around to see this petite woman standing behind me, giggling at me as if wow. I was a joke. Oh, so the woman... She's sexually... laughing at my reaction. Oh, so you got sexually assaulted by a woman? Shit. She then later brought me a beer to smooth things over <laughs> which i later declined because i wasn't consuming anything at that time <laughs> at that time she got very upset after me denying at that time i usually consume a lot of things but on that time i wasn't consuming anything <laughs> and her offer to uh, her offer of the alcoholic beverage i raised my voice at her on the dance floor expressing that i am not an object or a toy that you can play with also not to be that guy but like what does this have to do with the club or the promote? Like, um, we're probably going to get to the point, but c should you really be canceling a club or a promoter for somebody? Do like, don't you? Wouldn't you just like scold the person? Maybe alert security, get them chucked out or something. Why does this have to do with the club itself and get them closed out? You know, I don't know. Let's hear what he has to say. And you do not have any say in what happens to my body. I was furious. This is the fourth time that evening that I was violated. Ooh. The first three times happened within this. The first two times happened within a span of two hours. Twice before she violated me, and even once more by another person. After I went to the second floor to clear my mind. <laughs> Nobody talks about the overfetishization and infatuation over black queer people, particularly those who are feminine, presenting muscular, tall, and dark. <laughs> After that night, I noticed Gassing many people up. by the end of the party were giving me extremely dirty looks. I remember multiple people power walking away from me and my best friend and I were outside of bread alone. I remember thinking something feels off and I feel like I did something wrong. 30 minutes later, I was even called on the phone by a former friend who had then at that moment uninvited me to his place right after the party. Mind you, I was being asked for a week staying out with this person. So I knew something was seriously off. From then on, 75% of the people who claimed to be there for me and were my friend all cut me off, including at the time one of my other dear friends who I actually who had actually housed me when I first moved to the Netherlands. Okay, that's my first red flag. If you keep going to different cities and keep getting in situations like this, there has to be an issue with you at some point. If there's always a situation with him. Again, maybe it's not the best example, but there always seems to be an issue with him and clubs. 
in you know clubbing capitals of the world there seems to be an issue with him with going to places where all the clubs are known i mean like there's an issue there then the other issue here at point is that for some reason all his friends don't seem to back him up in his stories because I, me- I think he mentioned in the previous account of him being at fucking um grease muller um, or at river sudust that he had an issue there where he got chucked out and I think he mentioned even in that story that friends didn't help him out. So his friends who are there with him, his nearest, nearest people that know him well, don't stand up for him or back him up. Why is that? And now in Amsterdam, all the friends that he knew in that scene associated with that party cut him off. There's some, maybe, maybe it's you, brother. You know, Maybe there's something that you're doing. Maybe it's your personality. Maybe there's something about you that's making people react the way they are with you. Maybe. <laughs> Big up Josie. Don't worry, AZ. He'll be in London soon enough. <laughs> Lows. For me, after that, I noticed nobody was even standing next to me on the dance floor. Hmm. How is it that most people that make efforts to share their dance energy with me... By- exactly, Z. Something happened that we don't know. They can't have cut him off for some strange... Exactly. It doesn't make sense. If what he's saying is true, no friend would cut you off because you got sexually assaulted. That's insane, right? No, what friend would cut you off, would ignore you, wouldn't want to be a friend because you got sexually assaulted at a party? doesn't make any sense. Even if they invited you, they'd be concerned, they'd want to help you out, they'd want to sort out the problem, they'd want to get the person fucking reprimanded, whatever. They wouldn't just cut you off. And all his friends also. He got, he, he got fucking, he got disinvited from the afters, he got cut off from the group of friends, people he was meant to link there didn't want to see him anymore. Something, something's dodgy about this guy. Vice versa, all of a sudden, look at me like I'm a freak. I was verbally attacked for mentioning my abuse. I was ignored and I was being glared at from a distance. Fast forward six weeks. Uh-huh. I returned back to Amsterdam after two weeks from Berlin after performing. I go to another party called Maze. And that night I learned from uh, this individual, John Carlo, one of the organizers of Maze, that... Uh, this person who had molested me was an incredibly influential person in the techno scene. He also, in a threatening way, bullied me and intimidated me into not talking unless I wanted to experience greater consequences. This is actually queer Brazilian. I was shocked that I was being attacked by someone who had such a similar identity and energy as me. I don't even, I don't even know what I believe and what I don't believe. So you went back to Amsterdam, the place that you got sexually assaulted at. You went back to that city again. Cool. You went to another party. Cool. And then somebody at that party told you, hey, don't talk about the sexual assault that you inca- you suffered from a woman. Don't talk about it because that person's a big deal. I think he's missing some bits out of the story here. This doesn't sound believable. And the person that said it to him was also queer and also what? big black and strong like him or something is that what you're trying to say they were similar like me it's like they were super hot too (laughs) he explained that she had used her power and immediately slandered my name tarnishing reputation and turned many people connected to her against me she for several weeks openly admitted to assaulting me and had made me the running line of a joke that my reaction was way too dramatic because i'm quote unquote gay first of all i'm pansexual not that that's anyone's business (laughs) <laughs> Secondly, how dare somebody justify their abuse and behavior simply because of the assumed sexual orientation of the abused victim. She incriminated herself while making a joke out of what was one of the darkest moments in my life in a while. By the way, he's been trying to cry for the last five minutes and we haven't had a single tear yet. I think he's a bit of a psycho, man. Unfortunately. And it's sad too because he seems like a... He's got like a fun vibe. And I think if I met him in a cubicle somewhere, I'd probably have a blouse of him. He's definitely someone that you'd love to see on the dance floor. People like this, you kind of vibe off of on the dance floor. They 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 emit a real nice vibe and energy. Always smiling, laughing, dancing, looking amazing in the outfits and shit. But I think there's something going... I think there's there's a lot of like... This guy's a troubled individual. That's what I'm getting. Do you know what I mean? That's what I'm getting. A very troubled individual. I was more shocked about all the fake people who listened and believed her and did nothing to try to stop it. I now know who each of you are and I'm praying that you get the genuine love and healing that you need because that's extremely sick to allow this uh, to continue. And also everyone keeping it just a total secret for me for weeks. 
I was shocked to find out I was being discussed by so many people so heavily for seven weeks and nobody told me. I later learned from multiple people that there had been a group chat, there have been group chats about me to quote unquote boycott Nicholas Rose for an upcoming live show that I did at Rowdy on. It's so disgusting that a large group of people, predominantly white, who say Black Lives Matter on their Instagram and all that, and are so queer friendly at these techno parties are boycotting a black non-binary queer person. The one type of- If that's true, that must, again, there's something wrong with you. Come on, bro. Like, why would these people go out of their way to ostracize you and cut you off? Like, what is going on here? They want to boycott your fucking performances and shit. Like, what's happening? What have you done to get under these people's these skin? Something's happened, man, that he's not letting us know about. A person who is actually uh, most susceptible to this kind of violence was made to be turned into a target, victim shame to the point of no end. I've constantly been told that my reaction to this abuse is over-dramatized because of the sexual orientation people assume that I am. My abuser <laughs> immediately used her power to spread awful rumors about my reaction to her publicly molesting me. Today, I'm not afraid to name my abuser. Her, is, her name is Naomi Edry. Come to find out, the woman who molested me is the- That was, her that was so dramatic, bro. Again, no tears. Who's it? And Naomi Edry. Whoever you are, prayers. Today, I'm not afraid to name my abuser. Her, is, her name is Naomi Edry. Come to find out, the woman who molested me is the booking is married to the booking manager and promoter uh, for Radion, and she is uh, one of the promoters indoor host for Aura Party. It only got worse. The day before my performance that I did recently in November in Radion, um, I learned that the woman who molested me is the wife. My abuser immediately used her power to spread awful rumors about her reaction to her. So. Even though he got abused by somebody involved in the same place that he did the rave at or his performance at, or he, he still got to perform there. So where was this? What? I thought he would say, oh, they cancelled my show. I'm being blackballed now. They're not giving me sh all the shows I had booked already. They cancelled them. Like, so you still had your show. Hmm. Her publicly molesting me. Today, I'm not afraid to name my abuser. Her name is Naomi Edry. Okay, now we finally got tears. Not a lot of them, but we got a couple of tears, I see. Maybe a little line there, maybe. Come to find out, this woman who had violated me uh, was one of the promoters and door hosts for our party. Uh huh. It was her party. It only got worse. The day before my performance at Radion, I learned the woman who molested me is the wife of the booking manager of Radion. After learning this, I essentially became physically nauseous. <laughs> I vomited and I went into a panic attack. Because at that moment, I knew my intuition was spot on. I, I am so done with keeping quiet because of the status and power of her and her protectors. I am sick of not being able to fully trust people in clubs. I have experienced already so much sexual and race-based trauma in clubs. To be fair, you shouldn't trust anybody anywhere. To be fair, people should earn your trust. You don't just go into places thinking you can trust people. <laughs> doesn't matter if it's a quote-unquote safe space, if it's the party from a person that you know, a community you're you know comfortable with and whatnot. You should go into every space that you go into with some form of skepticism with one eye open checking your you know checking each shoulder like your fucking zavi you know in prime barcelona like you shouldn't ever go into any place you know super open with your with your asshole out you know ready for any finger or penis to enter you should obviously have somebody earn your trust and if you allow them then they can enter but you shouldn't just be giving yourself up openly to every space you go into that's probably on you you don't be over familiar or friendly with anybody I don't believe in cancelling. I believe in accountability. And I have to name names. Otherwise, this predator could get away with trying to conquer another black body. 
or body period. A small white lady that did all this, by the way. In a very niche subculture as well. It's like, you could just leave clubs behind. If this, if this happened, whatever. Let me just let him play. Whatever, whatever. I didn't have enough power to conquer this privately. So this is my only option. This person is Naomi Edry. Naomi Edry. I'm sure you are wondering okay. why I didn't try to solve this privately. I did. I did. What do you do? I went to the one person I felt comfortable reporting this to and Maron. someone I consider to be a friend. Maron? Isabel Hokong. Isabel Hokong. Is that the woman that was on Das Techno Team? Who's that? Who's Isabel Hokong? It broke my heart to bring up one of the darkest wounds to her. Uh huh. What'd you say? And it broke it even more, though Sorry they to have my off. reality denied by the way of gaslighting. What'd she say to you? Where's, your, where's the GSB? <laughs> In mid-November, Isabel, who's also a booker for Radion, posted on Instagram saying, and I quote, In the podcast series, Tough Love, we all talk about topics that are usually left unspoken. Oh, yeah, that was the woman for Death Techno Team. So that woman in Death Techno Team, what'd she say to you? The next snippet is about a very delicate topic, and before I share this, I would love to express my, myself first. Sexual harassment, crossing boundaries, rape, and everything in between happens everywhere in every industry and in every community. Uh -huh. These are topics no one talks about unless the harm is on such a large scale that justice is almost inevitable. Okay. In every other case, victims don't feel safe to open up, and when they do open up, they are faced with victim blaming, not enough evidence, okay. not enough proof, okay. cancel culture, okay. and with end results such as mental health problems, trust issues, and even death. Okay. It is also very hard for me to talk about these topics as well, but I feel I have no choice but if I it. want this industry to become a safer clubbing space. Cool. We need to talk about this. Clubs and promoters are usually run, and there we go again, by men. My advice is to hire more women in your team, hire more people of color on your team, hire more queer uh, refugees and marginalized people in general. They know best. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> Anyone reading this would immediately think, I gotta talk to her. But what really happened when I brought my experience to her? What happened? My reality was yet again denied. She told me on the phone it couldn't be Naomi, because she knows her so well and that I got it all wrong. She explained that I don't really know the real her, and that we need to have a discussion. Which I then later agreed to. When I reached out to me, when I, re uh, when I agreed to reach out, uh, that was the last time I heard from Isabel. I was disregarded and avoided, no meetings, no nothing, ignored. I knew that in the moment I was powerless. Though I put on several wonderful performances that night at Radion, I was hiding in pain and fear. <laughs> I thought at any moment my abuser would appear. <laughs> I got scared someone would hurt me. He's a shit actor, though. That's for sure. You might be a good actor. You might be a good dancer, but he's a fucking shit actor. The, the, he's forcing the tears so hard. It's like when you try and force a shit and it's not coming out. You just got to drink more coffee or move around a bit, you know, and then it might come out. But you can't force that shit. You just got to let it come. You got to let it come. No pun intended. Especially after hearing the night before and seeing it even in text, people were purposely wanting to quote unquote boycott Nicholas Rose. I kept throwing up after each show because I was dancing with so much fear in my body. It's hard to tell by looking at my latest video, the one I previously posted, me dancing. Subtle promotion there. Check my latest video out. Link in bio. Watch me dance. Watch me shake that little ass. This was actually the reality of what was going on inside of me. I was trying so hard not to cry. I know that many people couldn't understand that because it was invisible to the human eye that I was going through this. But I was locking myself in the bathroom multiple times between performances just to feel some sense of safety and security, just weeping and breathing and praying. Nobody should ever have to go through this. I wanted to share this with you because I want you all to know that sometimes you have to use your voice out loud. Well, we I'm done voice. being a victim. Yeah, right. He's going to move to Barcelona and do the exact same thing. He's going to go to Madrid or somewhere, Paris, maybe even London. He's not done yet, mate. He's not fucking done yet. He fucking loves this shit. I'm done being a victim. Yeah, right. I'm done being a victim. <laughs> trying to convince himself. I'm done giving away my power. I'm done with accepting the victim shaming and gaslighting. You all know who you are. Shame on you. 
both you and anyone connected to you who thinks this is okay. I've been sexually violated before in Radion, and the booking manager also knows personally of this happening to me. Brett, Radion, all other nightclubs that are in existence, that are about to be open, party, collectives, listen up. Do you still give a fuck about justice, safety, diversity, and inclusivity when people who you love and adore and trust so much are ruining black and queer people's reputations and lives behind closed doors or ignoring their cries for help? I have absolutely nothing to gain by sharing this story. If you think it's hard to hear, imagine actually going through this ridicule of many who are even strangers and being dismissed by one of the only people who I thought would genuinely help. I'm taking my power back today. Take it, baby. Take it back. On December 15th. Oh, yeah. Especially I'm taking my power back and I will not remain silent any longer. Let's Tell open baby. this conversation. It took a long time to say this. And I'm sure a lot of you were thinking, whatever happened to Nicholas? He started acting weird. He started falling back. He started disappearing. So was Referring yourself in third person when nobody knows who the fuck you are outside of, you know, really in deep, deep in the weeds techno people is insane. You're not that famous, brother. Relax. Re relax. Relax. That's a, that's a big red flag. Whatever, who was thinking whatever happened to Nicholas? Who was thinking that, really? I was dealing with this. It was ruining me. My health was at risk. Say again. It was ruining me. I was dealing with this. It was ruining me. It was ruining me. Say it again. It was ruining me. Back. He started disappearing. So I was dealing with this. It was ruining, it was ruining me. me. My health was at risk too. After all this started, I also ended up with kidney stones. The stress inside, the fear, everything. And it was all connected. That's probably your diet. <laughs> to be honest I knew that by mentioning these names I will end up with the risk of more people against me Probably. and also to be honest oh, you I'm so? so okay with that I'm so okay with that I'm okay with losing people what's most important is that I don't lose myself and I did for three months <laughs> I have done nothing but give mad love and incredible energy to each and every person that has met me. And all of a sudden, I was abused, mistreated, and essentially left for dead. So today I say, fuck you. I choose me and I take my power back and I choose. Okay, cool. He's done. Um, he's just incredibly unlikable, isn't it? That's the issue. He could be, it could be right what he said. It could be true. The things that he said could have happened. But he's such an unpleasant guy. He comes across so, he's so obnoxious, so insufferable, so dramatic, <sighs> egomaniacal, narcissistic. That is hard to empathize with him. It's hard to sympathize with his plight. It's hard to connect. It's hard to give a fuck. It really is because he's such an, he's obviously an unreliable witness anyway, but he's also a very unlikable person just through just the videos I've watched. And I've only heard him speak three times. The first confession or reveal expose rant of Rev River Sudus that first time, the Playful Magazine interview where he confessed about his, um, you know, addiction to GHB and then this third interview. I've only had three bits of, you know, stuff from him and already I'm like, there's something a bit dodgy about you as a person, something very unlikable about you that makes it hard for me and to understand and to ultimately believe you because this story sounds odd and it sounds just strange just in terms of probability that every time you go to a new city and you immerse yourself within the dance music, nightlife, techno scene of that city, you encounter problems. Every single city you go to, no matter how free no matter how liberal, no matter how welcoming, no matter how, how much, ex no matter how acceptable, you know, accepting, sorry, diverse, diverse they are, you seem to always bump into issues. You seem to always come across bad actors, bad characters who abuse you. Take it like, what is going on there? Is that just the scene overall is toxic or is the common denominator there you at some point? 
especially if you're losing friends it's different if like your friends are there but that detail about the friends is the one that really kind of like had my spidey senses tingling your actual friends in the scene the ones that you cultivate you know over a long period of time the ones that you connect with the ones that you know intimately over fucking after hours over drinks over lunches over dinners are the ones that disown you and you know abandon you in your moment of need when you've been assaulted it's it just doesn't smell right it seems fishy why would your friends abandon you in that moment the ones that were there the ones who maybe witnessed it or saw you post being abused that can you know there's something very I don't buy it, man. I don't buy it. I think this guy's full of shit. And I think, unfortunately, for whatever reason, instead of just focusing on his work, instead of focusing on becoming a great a great artist, instead of focusing on carving out a, a lane for himself in that regard, he's turned himself into this, I don't know, this virtue-signaling crusader, this weird moral bastion. And unfortunately, some of his you know some of these accusations just don't sound believable or just even the the scenario around it the story like i feel like he's leaving out a lot of details he's making himself out to be the perfect victim but he's not really accounting for whatever part he might have played in it zero there's no real you know acknowledgement of maybe what he's may have done in the past maybe you know some of his miscommunication maybe some of the things he did or said non-verbally whatever it's just always somebody else's problem somebody else did something else to him he's the, always the victim in every single situation he's the innocent victim and i don't know there's something about it that just doesn't seem believable but again what do i know what do i know what do i know but it doesn't it doesn't sound believable to me i don't think this is i don't, I don't buy in the slightest but Nicholas Oliver saying this. Um, but let's see actually what happens, what transpires. It's a shame really, because, you know, he's going around and really creating a bad reputation for himself and people out here are not going to be too pleased with him. Um, but let me see actually what happened to, if there's, what the response has been on his Instagram, because that might be a bit illuminating to see maybe if other people have said the same thing that I've said or if they're all kind of rallying around him. And I'm here, I'm curious to see actually what Maron said, because Maron was playing there. So maybe he was DJing there. Maybe that will be an indication on how, what the vibe is with people in there. But from time he's saying the Booker promoter and stuff aren't believing him and aren't backing his plight, that maybe is a, you know, an insight into what happened and how it went bad. Oh, is it? Oh, it's not there anymore. He might have taken it down. Uh-oh, maybe he deleted the video. I'm on his Instagram now and I don't see the video. So maybe he deleted the video. Maybe the video is gone. Oh. Maybe the video is gone. That might explain it. Maybe the video is gone. I don't see it on his Instagram. So maybe he got he got told to take it down. Okay. That might be a good thing, to be honest, for all people involved. But yeah, okay. There we go. There's no video on here. So maybe maybe he got told to take it down. Who knows? But Jesus Christ, man. Jesus Christ. Anyways, um, that has been the Axel Zinger Show, episode number six, seven, no, six? I think it's seven, three something, right? Seven, three, two. Thank you so much for tuning into the Axel Zinger Show, episode number seven, three, two. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If you've enjoyed the show and you like what you've seen, you like what you see, you like what you see, please make sure you smash the like button down below. If you're watching via the podcast app, or if you listen to the podcast up, you'll hear my tune today. That'll be playing underneath this my voice as it goes out. And I'll see all you guys again very, very soon.